Hello and welcome to the Mythical Ireland podcast. I'm Anthony Murphy. For episode 13, I had the enormous pleasure of a long and fascinating conversation with artist Richard Moore, who is a longtime friend and was co-author with me on Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers. This is one of two planned conversations. The first one is all about Richard's life as an artist and includes discussion of his plans for a forthcoming book. The second conversation, which will be featured in the next episode, will deal with Richard's passion for monuments and mythology. In the meantime, if you are a new listener, you might be interested in visiting the Mythical Ireland website over at www.mythicalireland.com. We are on facebook.com forward slash mythical Ireland too, and don't forget to check out the Mythical Ireland community while you're on Facebook also. There are hundreds of hours of videos on the YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash mythical Ireland. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe for regular updates and new videos. If you'd like to support Mythical Ireland, you can become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash mythical Ireland. Your contributions are rewarded in the form of early and exclusive access to photographs, blog posts and articles, podcasts, videos and more. Don't forget to visit the shop on the Mythical Ireland website where you can buy signed copies of my books and also photographic prints, posters and calendars. Right, with the announcements out of the way, we can get straight on to the good stuff. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Richard Moore. (laughs) off we go (laughs) so Richard um, we're here in your studio in your house in the Dublin Road in Drogheda and we're going to have a couple of conversations which I'm looking forward to so am I Um, the first one we're just going to talk about your art and the second one then we'll talk about monuments and mythology and your passion for the landscape and the ancient landscape and island of the setting sun and all that i wanted to start by asking you i have a question to open the the conversation which is do you remember the first moment at which you decided or that you thought i want to be an artist that that's what you wanted to do with your life. I do, yes. I remember I was doing art in school and uh, my parents were quite encouraging and they kept me going to an art class with Miss Barrett who was, uh, she used to teach in Green Hills and then she used to teach at home on a Saturday so I used to go up there. But I liked the art. I wasn't... Um, I knew nothing about artists as such. They were sort of a. They weren't. Um, they weren't something that I would relate to. I just like painting, colours. But uh, the first time now, my sister was uh, friendly with this fellow called Danny O'Mahony. Uh, they had a shop in Shop Street, and um, he had a studio over in the Mill Mill Row, uh, off Trinity Street. Yeah. And. Um, she said, come on down, meet this fella, Danny. So I remember going into the studio, and it was a proper studio, like paintings everywhere, the smell of oil paint and tubs and all that stuff. As soon as I walked into the room, I said, wow, I like this. This is really nice. Mm-hmm. And, it was, and it was the first time that I realised that here's somebody actually working full time. Now, I was in fifth year in Secondary school. That's going to ask what age you were, yeah. Yeah, so I was a bit 16, 17. So, <clears throat> so he took me on and showed me how to make up canvases, set up a still life. So I, that was the first time I did oil painting properly. Uh, so he set up a still life and did the, made up two canvases and painted, painted that. And I really enjoyed it, and it was kind of this is this is great, you know. 
So that was really the first time I sort of I got a, a girl for. You know, maybe I could do this, you know. So that was that was the first time. And. That's around 1975, I think. Well, you're giving away your age now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. And um, do you have any memories before that from your childhood of drawing or painting and sort of mm -hmm. feeling retrospectively, of course, feeling, looking back that, you know, yeah. That makes sense now. This yeah. is something I tell you, I, that I could really do. When, when I was a kid... Uh, I used to, when I was in sec uh, primary school, I used to go for lunch uh, with these people called Mullins. They lived over in the, the, the Market Square, you know, the, what do you call that place? Bolton Square. Yeah. They had a house there just opposite the shop there. The Mullins were their names. But I used to go over there and at lunchtime. And Jim Mullin, uh, he used to work in CIE. Lovely man. Uh, he used to catch bees for me because he always... Thought I was I was always interested in in little creatures, and but he used to put the bees in a jar, but he'd take the sting out so that I I wouldn't get hurt yeah. if I if I happened to let one out. Yeah. But uh, I was always fascinated by the color of the bees, like the oranges and the yellows and the beautiful colors they had, and I'd just sit looking at them all day, you know, and also the flowers. They, they had lovely um, flowers in the garden and I used to really get a buzz off the colour. It's only years later I realised um, this was this was sort of inherent, or uh, what would you call it? The, the love of colour was actually there all along. Yeah. But I would never have known at the time this is what it was going to lead to. It's, it's almost like it's, you're, it's in you but you just don't know it yet. Yes. And this was kind of um, the pointer. So that's why when I'm teaching kids, I'm always asking them, what do you like? What kind of things uh, attract you? So that they, um, I can pinpoint what direction they really want to go in. So, but that was the yeah, road signs, like the, you know, like the yellow on the, the road signs. When we'd be out driving, we used to say, oh, that's a lovely colour, isn't it? <laughs> you know, stupid things. But, but for me, it was a buzz. I was getting a buzz off it. Yeah. So... It's only now, as being an artist, and that's what I work with, is colour all the time. Colour is the thing I work with. Yeah, I shouldn't be surprised because when I look at your work, it's full of that vibrant colour. Mm. And flowers, they're great teachers of how to mix colours. Because they're so pure and so strong that sometimes they don't even have the, the, the colour in the tube to get it. So you have to... You have to go and look for the that particular colour to get the purity of it, to so that what the eye sees, you can put it on the canvas. Yeah. So that's interesting. I never would have thought that that you'd have an incomplete colour array. Yeah. You know, on your palette. That yeah. Would you would you have that situation often where you'd have to go and look for? Yeah. Co yeah. Specific colours. Well, especially if you're working with flowers, yeah. Well, they uh, could be gone in a few days' time, yeah. <laughs> given the vagaries of the Irish weather. Yeah. Well, I work with time. I don't work against it. Mm. I work with it. If things change, I change with it. Wow. It's okay. um, the nature tells you what, what, what is there. It, it's like having a conversation. If you if you ask something, you wait for the answer, and you get the answer. It'll talk to you if you listen. In my case, it's the visual thing. Um, so, so when you're looking at the colour, you keep looking at it till you, you get it. That's, I don't know whether that makes sense, does mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's how it works for me. Yeah. And in terms of that sort of c the colour of nature, um, would you have spent a lot of time as a youngster out in nature? Yes. Um, uh, I used to do a lot of fishing and shooting and so most of my time was outdoors mm. See, my father was big into fishing and shooting so anytime he was going out I was making sure I was going to be with him because I love walking the countryside um, it wasn't so much the, the shooting I mean I just liked being out uh, there was so much to see um, oh, it's just, it's, 
nature's full of surprises, that's all. It's just you don't know what you're going to see the next, in the next step or what plants you're going to come across. Or It's just, it's, it's full of surprises. So yeah. it's only natural I would end up working in the landscape. Mm. And then people, um, I love talking to people um, because everyone has a, an interesting story. You, you don't know what you're going to hear At from some people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you, your, um, your work, your body of work encompasses everything from landscapes and townscapes and people and still life and nature. Is there an area you feel that you uh, have a particular expertise in or that is your particular strength? No, I don't have um, any expertise. Uh, it's, I'm just an observer. I just like to watch and, and record or ask questions. Why is, why is such and such a thing there? Why is it that colour? What's, what's that about? You know, there's, there's always some mystery about when you look at something for the first time, um, what's going to reveal, what it's going to reveal in itself. Um, well, it's just, it's, it's so full of surprises. Um, I can't think of anything in particular just right now, but because every time I go out, there's always something new. Well, I've known you, as you know, for 22 years. And I'd always have got the impression from you that you have, because you spend time painting, you see in a way that a lot of people don't see because I think people in general don't stop and take that time. No. Um, okay. I go out and I stand in a spot for a couple of hours, maybe even a couple of weeks. Depends on what I'm painting. So I'm looking at patterns every day changing. Or I, I say, say, for instance, if I'm on the street, um, I go down there every day. You see the same people going to work. There's a pattern. Mm -hmm. In the morning you meet certain people, in the afternoon it's certain people. People park their cars in certain places. There's certain, there's patterns, there's a flow of light that, that has a pattern. Um, the, the other thing that's a bit like that is watching the river. Um, if I, like say I did a painting of um, just the water in front of me. Um, every now and again you have little whirly pools, bubbles, that will appear roughly in the same spot over a period of a, an hour or three hours. So you're watching all this thing, these patterns taking place. Um, so as, as they happen, I put them in and then I might come back for another five or two minutes, put it back, you know, develop that and c continue on. And then you build up your picture by what you've observed over the three hours or the weeks or the months, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you begin to see things differently. Uh, you it's like a time lapse. You know the way in a photograph you have a time lapse. You know you you, you see things happening. It's recorded as a streak, maybe the light. But um, it's not a it's not a, a two hundred and fifty of a second image of mm. something I'm looking at. It's a three week time lapse. Yeah of what I'm taking in. And some of these patterns and these little details yeah. would appear to the ordinary Joe Soap to be such trivial things. And yet, am I wrong in saying that for you, there's a profundity there. These are yeah. these are almost profound moments that are happening before you. Yeah, because it's, 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 um, it's like a signal being repeated. Or it's say, say, for instance, if you listen to a piece of music, there's a beat or, or a rhythm to things mm. so it's 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 like seeing music being played that's would be the best way to describe it interesting yeah you know george william russell um and i know we're going to talk about newgrange the next on the next conversation but in a dream of angus oak he said there's a phrase where he talks about light had a voice and the music hung glittering in the air. This is in relation to the sunbeam coming into Newgrange. 
Yes. Which he appeared to have foreseen in 1897, something like 70 years, 70 years actually exactly, before O'Kelly would discover that. And I, I always thought that was a fascinating turn of phrase to to describe light as if it had sound. And here you are making the same connection. Yeah, yeah, it is that, yeah. There's a, a sound wave, a light wave. It's pretty much in that sort of rhythm. Does your artist's way of thinking ever... Um, what's the question does does you know that way of thinking does it ever hinder you in life in your dealings with other people hmm. um, that's a good question uh, can you give me sort of a, a hindrance like it's probably a difficult question but I mean just from the point of view that you clearly have a sort of a vision that extends beyond the colour that you see you know you have a broader vision. Okay, um, you only live once. You gotta. I want to know what it's about. Why? Why are we here? All that kind of stuff. It's all. This is just my way of questioning my existence. Yeah. Um, I, I, a curiosity about why I'm here or what it's about. And it, the more I explore, the more wonderful it is. Um, now, a hindrance is, there are things you'd like to do, but you can't, because it's just not possible. Um, society may not understand that, but um, I think it's important just to follow that, follow what yourself, be yourself as much as you can. Um, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's a kind of a, um, that's a deep question. Well, perhaps we'll be, given an opportunity during the course of the conversation to come back to it and to flesh it out a little bit. Yeah. Because you see, a lot of people are in rhythmic lives and you've talked about rhythm there, which is yeah. interesting. And as you say, they park in the same spot, they come and go to work. They're following patterns. Yes. And your pattern is, you know, gathering your materials together and going out there. And, and it's not really a pattern outside of the, you know, the uh, the humdrum of, you know, as I say, bringing the materials to a place. Uh, when you get up in the morning, what what motivates you to go to a particular spot? Uh, that's a hard question now because it would have been much <laughs> I keep easier. Keep asking to, hard questions. No, you know, no, but it, it would have been much easier when I'm when I'm on the roll. At the moment, I'm not really on the roll. To um, I haven't got. As much of a drive to paint at the moment. Mm. Um, um, things have been sort of awkward for the last couple of years. So um, it's sometimes you burn out. Uh, yeah. you, you paint so much and you do so much, and then you kind of run into a, a dead end. It's, it's a little bit like the artist's equivalent of writer's block, I'm sure. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you just have to do nothing. Yes and st sit still and be quiet mm. and let it um it's a bit like a, a sponge uh, you can dip a sponge into the water lift it out and then squeeze it out and that's your work what you squeeze out is the work from soaking up all your uh, surroundings so you squeeze it out and that's you know, might be two or three years working and then you just it nothing left so you have to stop and go back into the water and soak up more to 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 build it up again it's it's that's the way it works for me i can't force it you can't um i can't you can't force a flower to come out before it's time there's a time for all these things so you have to if you go if you try to push it it kills it um so you have to be careful you have to be very careful to look after that part of you yeah, because you can. It's you see, it, artists in general are quite sensitive to to what's going on around them, because if they didn't have that sensitivity, they wouldn't be able to see or produce the work they do. So you have to sort of mind that. So yeah, uh, sometimes it's very hard not to do 
not, it's hard to do nothing, you know. You just mm -hmm. you've no choice. You, yeah. Because you, you must um, protect that. Yeah. Uh, that's I have to say that's a singularly brilliant analogy is the sponge. Yeah. I've never heard that one before. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's the only thing I it's the only thing I could relate to. Yeah. Um, because I know that when I go out into the landscape, I'm soaking up new information from around me, especially if I haven't been in the landscape before or some some new revelation comes up about a, a place and it becomes fascinating to work with. So all I want to do is just paint, 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 you know, for, for just do as mm. I can't stop. Yeah. But then you see, you you, you use it up and then it, yeah. it, it's time to stop. That makes complete sense, unless, of course, you're very commercial, in which case I think your I work is tainted. Yeah, to an I can't. Extent. I can't. I, money doesn't. Uh, I don't give a shit. It's okay. I think about money, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't care about money much. I don't really. It doesn't. It's not. It's not a motivation for me mm. to. It's not the reason I do it. Um, if you do something for money, it's just, it's not, um, there's something wrong, you know, it's just not coming from the heart. It has to, painting for me, and if you want to do good quality, it has to come from the heart. It, it's, if it's not inside first, it, it's just not worth doing it. And if only one, if you can say, if only one life, you might as well do the right thing. Yeah. I would say one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century was Alan Watts. Mm. And Alan Watts famously, um, in, in a, a wonderful piece of advice for people about, <laughs> well, don't worry, the noises of the traffic and the dog and everything are part and parcel of the house. So we don't, we won't pay any attention. The dog is yakking in the background. <laughs> you all right, Roxy? Well, what I was going to say was Watts sort of encouraged people who are on that threshold of deciding what they're going to do with their lives to park or to ignore money mm. as an influence in their choice. What would you do if money wasn't a thing and wasn't an issue and didn't make the world go around? What would you do to set your heart on fire? What would you do as work in your life that when you're going out the door in the morning or wherever you're, whatever you're yeah. doing in your work, that you... You never feel like you're going to work. Oh no, I never feel I'm going to work. That's that doesn't that's, surprise me. No, it doesn't. Because I I really like doing what I do. That's that's the bottom line. But there's there's a there's an energy there that you can soak up. Uh, it just gives you fire. It, it, it gives you energy. Whatever whatever that is, it's. Yeah, it's just a words. I can't find the words for it at the moment. Mm. <clears throat> I have uh, one of my kids. Uh, he's into music and he's a big fan of Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. And he said to me a while back, he said, Dad, do you know that, you know the way all Billy Joel's hits are in the past? I was like, well, I don't know much of Billy Joel's music. But he said, I'll tell you the reason, he said, because it just came to the stage where he, he realised this is what he told me anyway that oh you know i have done all my great work and and i can't force myself to do it i can't make hit music happen mm. and he has taken apparently a long hiatus from composing songs because he feels that he has achieved what he set out to achieve now <laughs> that's not quite the sponge because you're hoping that the sponge absorbs water and you can get going again. Yeah. But, I mean, it makes completely sense, complete sense to me that a person who's creative isn't necessarily endlessly creative. That there come those highs and lows, like a sine wave, you yeah. know? Mm. That you have those peaks where you're full of create, creative energy. Your, your output is phenomenal. But as you say, they are balanced by those periods where you... There's a bit of uh, introspection, maybe, and a little bit of calm and quiet. Yeah, it has to. Do you it think has, it's a it necessity? It has to be like a river, you know. The, the river is, the, it doesn't, it's not the same water. Yeah. It's always fresh, yeah. a flowing river. So if you keep dipping into that, you get fresh material all the time. Yeah. You, just, you have to know where it is, though. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you have to, if something interests you, just go with it. Um, you might have a plan from to go from A to B, but on your way to B, something might just catch your eye. But you have to be very careful not to continue going to B, because this this thing that's caught your eye on the way is where you should go. Yeah. And stop and have a look at that, because that usually is the that's where the pot of gold is. Yeah. You got to go down that area and have a look at that and that usually opens up a whole new path a whole new direction even that's fascinating because another of the great philosophers of the 20th century in my view is Joseph Campbell who wrote a lot about mythology and Campbell says pretty much the same thing when he says you know you come to the edge of a forest and you see certain pathways beaten through the forest and you're trying to decide which one to take Mm mm-hmm and his advice is, don't take any of them. Beat your own path through yeah. the forest. Because to take another path is to take someone else's path and to do something perhaps that's not invigorating you in the way that life could have done if you had beaten your own path. Exactly. So that makes complete sense. Yeah, it does make sense. It is sensible, yeah. Yeah. Because then it's it's um, it's fresh. It's, it's completely unknown to yourself what's going to happen next. And that's the excitement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because you just don't know what you're going to see so you like spontaneity oh yeah oh yeah so so go back to the question then uh when you're getting up in the day Mm. and you want to know i know this is not current but say a few years ago when you were painting what like i know you probably don't do you consciously decide well in advance where you're going or do are there some days when you just gather the gear together put your easel on your back and just walk until you find yeah, a spot and get the signal. Yeah, that's it. Really? Yeah. And just would that be the case there might be with something much of your work in terms of the most percentage? Of it, yeah. Yeah, most of it, really? yeah. Most of it's just, I could be walking through a landscape and to go someplace and do the painting, but on the way back, I'd say, oh, there's another painting, oh, there's another one, oh, there's another one. And I wouldn't have seen <laughs> them on the way. Yeah. But it's, it's after painting. Yes. Being in the, immersed in the place... And then on your way back, you start to see other compositions that, oh, yeah, that'll be fabulous, that'll be great, I'll have to do that. And then you, suddenly, before you know it, you have about 20 other paintings <laughs> on the go, and you just don't want to go home. You just want to get up early in the morning, six and five or six, as soon as it's light, or even in my case, it doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, I'll paint at night time. Yeah. So, so your senses are heightened, as it were, by the act of painting, and that yeah. encourages you to do more. Yeah. I feel normal when I paint. Um, say, say for a lot of people out there that would be unemployed well if I'm not painting that's how I feel I'm unemployed yeah. I'm not I don't feel normal It's wh- as soon as I have the brush in my hand and I'm out painting and I'm getting into it I feel totally at ease and uh, not, I feel absolutely normal this is this is this is what I'm doing you know yeah I feel I'm in my space yes it's my sacred space and you know that that makes you very fortunate and privileged because I, I maintain that there are less than t- 10% of people, in, I'm talking about Ireland yeah. in particular, in, I'd say in the Western world, there's probably a- about 5% of people who are truly doing what they're, uh, what gives them the greatest fulfillment in life. Yeah. It's very important um, to, to get there, that, that, to, be, to be yourself. Um, does if you don't mind me asking does the fact that sometimes you're not in the zone as it were as an artist and that's hell and consequently there's no income yeah that's hell uh, yeah that's I mean that obviously has to be a factor in modern day existence when you've bills to pay and you have to feed yourself yeah, I've been quite a few occasions like that, all right. And I remember one time, um, there was no money, didn't know what I was going to do. And somebody had said they were interested in a painting about six or seven months before that. And I was sort of saying, oh, they're probably not interested now, so long ago. And then another side had said to me, well, you won't know till you ask. And then I said, right, OK, I'll give them a buzz. Sure. Look, the best thing to do is to find out. At least I won't have to think about it any further. Anyway, they ended up saying, oh, yeah, I'm glad you called. 
them down and so they'd buy the painting that's me out of a hole and straight away so it's just it's it's having a little bit of confidence too uh, but it can it can be quite difficult at times you know yeah because there's this because you're your own boss you have to drive yourself mm. and that's uh, not a well there'd be a cliched viewpoint that you know the typical artist is, is a starving artist you know um, that if you really <clears throat> if you're really invested in the act of creating artwork yeah. and you're not commercially driven in other words you're not part of a commercial studio no. you're not working for a company that's saying Richard we want three paintings from you a week or three a month or whatever it happens yeah. to be as you say you're you're your own boss yeah so I suppose in relation to in in tandem with the creative curve mm. which has its peaks and troughs there's the economic curve yeah. goes alongside that I presume yeah and is there ever, sorry for asking, but no, no. is there ever a moment when you're in one of those those troughs where you say, feck it anyway, why didn't I do something else? No. <laughs> no, yes, the, the, the low time is bad because you've, you, you've no drive, you've no money, and you're trying to, you're trying to control your integrity as well and um, you have to try and keep those things in place so and then your confidence drops and yeah that's not a good place to be mm. but you got to have faith in god which is where i go i go to i go to the almighty because if it didn't have that now I, I wouldn't be here now you know so yeah. that keeps me sane because i know that i know that at the end of it all it's worth it yeah. and that spiritual connection with with god is uh, is is very important to me that I keep that thread alive because yeah. I know well I mean I truly believe it but I know that over the years um, he stepped in when I know that there's, there's, there's people out there that don't believe in that but it, in, from my own experience he stepped in at the right time and always does no matter how low things have been there's always some miracle that just pulls you out of it. Yeah, so this isn't blind faith, as it were. Yeah. You know, it's faith based on experience. Yeah. And I do intend, of course, to talk about your religious beliefs because I think they're important to your work. But before that, let's just go back a little bit because I want to talk a little bit about how your life might have been a reflection of the lives of some of the great painters. Um, so let's take a little bit step, step of a step back in time when you finished school, you then went to study art in university, is that right? <clears throat> well, not straight away. No. Because I failed my Leaving Cert. <coughs> and I failed my art, actually, in my Leaving Cert. Really? Yep. I never knew that. Yeah, well, that's... It's just... I, I scarcely believe it. Well, no, it's true. I, I didn't get the exam, so I had to go back and do my Leaving Cert to try and build up the my points to get into a, a place, so... As much as I hated school, I had to I had to go back and do it. Um, so I got it the second time, and then I applied for a couple of colleges. Uh, I didn't get into any of them except Waterford. And lucky enough, the guy that was in Waterford was Paul Funge, and he saw the paintings I had done, and he liked what I had done, but the rest of them didn't. Didn't think it was good material, so uh, he insisted I get in. So thank God he was around. Otherwise, I, would, I, I remember them asking me a question. Said, "What would you do if you don't get in?" I said, "I'll be back next year." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing Brilliant anything else. determination. Yeah, yeah so it's a peculiar thing, though, that you, you should have to pass a certain standard of work. Like art is so subjective, and beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, it's not like you're sitting a pilot's exam or a medical exam or you're, you're going to be study to be an accountant and you have to be able to make the sums add up yes it's a strange thing is it not to have to you know for somebody know, else to yeah, judge your work you know? I, thought, I thought it was funny because I was waiting in the waiting room waiting before you go in for the interview I was we were sharing uh, work with other people that were going in and I was looking at the watch. I said, why is he going to ask school? He's bloody brilliant, you know. What's he going to... <laughs> I can't teach him anything else. <laughs> yeah. That was my thinking at the time. Yeah. But all I wanted to do was learn how to do, be better, you know. 
Yeah. I wanted to learn my trade. I wanted. To, I didn't know anything. Uh, you know, all, that's all I wanted was and, to learn. And so, so, how soon after this uh, meeting with uh, Funge and his colleagues, did you get word that you were successful, or did you have? I was to? a few. It was a, the following week or so. Okay. No, it was quite. Well, it was quite. And were you surprised? The answer is delighted. a positive, obviously. Oh yeah, I was delighted. Yeah. And do you think that uh, statement swayed things a little bit? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's a. But, I mean, but, uh, something you liked for what I did. He was. He liked the paint work. See, he was a painter himself. Mm. I suppose he just saw something. Well, you're you looking know. for character too, aren't you? Yeah. You're not just looking for raw talent. No. No. You're looking for somebody. This is what I want to do. God damn it. Yeah. And 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 if it kills me, I'm gonna be studying here. Yeah. And it's a. I mean, yeah. I think I happen to think it's an exemplary attitude, and it's the sort of attitude in my own professional life. When I was interviewing people for jobs, when I was in editorships of newspapers, I always looked for that yeah. character, that person who obviously had the drive to do it, even if they weren't immensely talented immediately. Because yeah. you knew you could work with that. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing. See, I, just, trumps. I, I didn't know my trade. I didn't know. I wanted, that's what I wanted to go there was to learn how to be better at what I do and, mm. and explore that. Yeah. But they were the best years of my life. How long were you in Waterford then? Uh, four years. Yeah. And you you stayed down there in Diggs, did you? Yeah. And, and so you were away from Drogheda for a long time? Yeah, for the four years. Yeah. And that was, a, I, I know from talking to you over the years, it's a time that you were very fond of. I, uh, you feel that was the time that everything happened for you? And, it did, yeah. yeah. Because um, you got up in the morning, went into college, painting all day or doing whatever you do art was come home, just start, get out the pencils, start painting at home or sketching. The lads in, the cl- in my flat were the same, so we were all painting 24 hours a day nearly. If you know what I mean, you were in total heaven for me. You know? <laughs> so, what more could you want? Yeah. And no pressure. And you had, of course, the support of your parents as well, oh, which is God, lovely. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. they didn't throw the eyes up to heaven when you said you wanted to be an artist. <laughs> no, they were very supportive. Uh, yeah, that way because, well, they they knew me anyway. They knew I was had a had a a feeling for us. So when you were in college and you started learning about the great masters and the Renaissance <coughs> and all that, yeah, you, presumably you studied art history. Yeah. Now this is going back to the earlier question: How much of your own life now, having sort of how many years on from Waterford are we now? Are you three or four decades? More, um, nineteen seventy five to nineteen eighty, four, four and a half decades. Then, yeah, you, you know how much of yourself do you see in the life of the great art, artists, and vice versa, in terms of that, well, dogged determination to do what you want to do and the passion for it, but also then maybe the lean times. Yeah, well, if it's when you look at some of the artists, like say the impressionists, which I like a lot. Um, they would no dole of support mm. most of them and I don't know how they I, do, I really don't know how they they could stick it out mm. and and live under those conditions and still paint you know, to, to me they were the most courageous bunch of people I've ever read about you know they stuck to they believed in themselves so much they were prepared to go through hell to get there you know and then they may have got, <coughs> gone for days without food at times and yeah. stuff like that oh yeah sleeping in the hovels and yeah going to yeah I really, I really don't know how they had the will to keep going were there particular artists when you were studying them that immediately you, you, you had a, an attraction to or that you thought it, well, it wasn't, were icons it, it wasn't until later on when I met up with Raphael Hines later on in 1980 that Raphael was big into the history of the Impressions and Monet and Renaissance and so he was, he was sort of t- telling me about them whereas I'd only just cursory glanced at say P- Paul Cezanne because of Paul Funge was talking about Cezanne and, but I, I loved his paintings anyway uh, so if you're looking through books you know, oh yeah I like that you know that painting or I like that particular artist's work but uh, it wasn't until um Rafi was talking about money. I remember one time when we were in the series, he was on talking about money and, and the, the haystacks, and, and we were looking at the paintings of the haystacks. 
And I said, I was looking at the painting, and I said, there's no way you can see those bloody colours. There's not a chance. I don't believe, I think he's having this on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm going to have to find out for myself. So I went out and went up the fields to have a look at the pa pa these haystacks, and um, I came back a few hours later, and I said to Rafe, yeah, he's telling the truth. <laughs> they, those colours are there. There's no doubt about it. My God, he's brilliant, you know. Yeah. So I had a great admiration for money after that because I knew he wasn't bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the same goes for Suzanne. Any of those great artists, they're all, they're all. It's just when you see them and they, they hit, they work for you. When you look at the painting, they're just, they just, they, they sing, you know. Uh, visually, they do. Do you have a favorite? No, just too many. And do you have any least favorites? Least favourites? Yeah. Any artists in the world uh, of historical art that you're... No, well, the ones that are bullshitting, I suppose. Yeah, I wouldn't be... I, I won't say who, but... Yeah. It's just that they're not... If they're not coming from the heart, I've no time for them. You know? mm. there's, there's stuff out there that's just purely commercial, and I, I, don't, I wouldn't waste my time looking at them. So you're discerning too? Well, I, I, can't, I have to be, you know. I have to... I have to work with the with the positive energy that's in the painting. If it's if it's working for me, it's selling me. It's I'm, it's communicating with me. Yeah. Now I do I do give paintings that I'm not sure about. I give them plenty of time. I say a lot of this abstract work now might not appeal to me at first, but I never close the door on it because I always say, well, maybe one day I might want to go in there and and explore that aspect of it. So I don't. And there are abstract paints I really like that people wouldn't would be very surprised. You know, oh, how do you like that? And it's just it works for me. You know, mm. so I can't really say, you know, they either work for me or they don't. And it's very subjective. You know yourself, no, no two people can, you know, you might have a favourite painting, I might think it's a load of rubbish, and then you, and vice versa. So, you know, some people love blue, other prefer green, other prefer yellow and orange. So, everybody's subjective to that. So, no, it's, a, it's open for everyone. I think you just follow, follow what works for you. Yeah. When you were in college then, in university, and you're studying art, I mean, how does it work in terms of exams? I mean, how do they, how okay. do they, what do they grade you on, you know? Well, they grade you on your drawing and the painting, um, what else? They'll give you a project to work with uh, for a couple of weeks and then they assess what you've done and how you've managed to deal with this. And again, if your drawing is good, you know, that helps. If your use of colour or your use of space or how you compose things, how you arrange things, it either works or it doesn't. And then they, they, they interview you as well. So you, they might come in and say, well, why did you do that? And you ha that's how you answer that question is, is um, if you believe in yourself and why you, why you did it, you explain what, what it was all about and it makes sense, that's fine. Yes. But what if it doesn't make so, so, Sorry, but what if it doesn't make sense? So for instance, what if you had answered, well, I was on my way from A to B and something caught my eye between the two and I decided to go off the path? Yeah. That that makes sense. That would make sense to them. Yeah, because it, that's that's being observant and creative and and not being afraid to leave a projected path that is a little bit obvious. The answer is going to be the same. You know, you know that when you get there, this is the result. The result is already known. Whereas if you take a, a different path, the result is unknown. So you might discover something new, and that's being creative. And yeah, you get you get. Brownie points for that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just thinking that, you know, it's so subjective. I mean, even if you think about, I mean, my, my area is writing and you think about music, you think about the, the record companies that turned the Beatles down and said they wouldn't go anywhere. If you think about J.K. Rowling and the likes of yeah. Aaron, great writers who went on to sell tens of millions of books who were told by publishing houses, you know, you're not up to it. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen for you. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. Is it the same in the world of art? Yeah. Sounds like it is. It is, yeah. yeah. Same. No different. <laughs> I I have this picture in my head. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but um, I think it's funny. But I hope you enjoy the humour. I have a picture in the head of Shawshank Redemption, oh, yeah. and uh, Red Morgan Freeman's character sitting in front of the parole board for the seventeenth time. Yeah. You know, it's like, go ahead, Sonny, stamp your form, because to tell you the truth, I don't give a shit, <laughs> right? And I I picture you there, you know, being scrutinised by your superiors in college, having the same kind of attitude, because at the end of the day, art is, as I say, so subjective. Yeah. You there's a confidence obviously that comes with well, I'll give you a laugh um, when I was finished college the next stage was to do your art teaching principles now that meant that if you got into the college which was NCAD I think you had to do a year's um, study without painting so it was all written work and stuff like that so all right. for teaching you see yeah so when I heard that, I said, there's no effing way I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to spend a year not painting. Can't no, say, that's can't not say I blame happen. you. Yeah. So, but I, I was kind of under pressure to go and do the interview. And uh, so I went in anyway, and they started asking questions. So I deliberately gave them um, answers that were completely nonsensical to, to ensure that I wouldn't get this. <laughs> <laughs> so to ensure that I wouldn't get there it's true you know so I failed miserably thank God yeah well I think to be honest you know <laughs> no there was nothing else I wanted to do well, so I... that painting is going to be what I want that's what I want and I knew that's what I was once I found out once I walked into that studio I knew that's that's what I wanted that's that's me yeah talk to me for a moment about the the Richard Moore that began college in Waterford versus the Richard Moore that left college four years later. Yeah, okay. When I left college, I left a lovely environment where you had people around you painting every day. Your teachers were painters. You know, you had all this cocoon of art. But when I came home to draw it, there was none of that. It was all gone. That was, there was no one else painting around here that I really knew, except apart from Danny O'Mahony. Uh, but there were no other artists and I wasn't and I remember going out one day after spending some time trying to do some abstract work in the house and thinking oh, I, just, I'm not, I don't want this this is not interesting so I'll go out and I'll just try a landscape and just see how that goes so I went up to the graveyard and did a small painting and was so fascinated by the grass in the foreground I said oh we we'll go home and get another board. So I come up in the afternoon, did another one, and I haven't stopped since. And that was that. That was the trigger. Yeah. Back to the landscape. I got, I got because I was so delighted that I went out, picked something totally random that appealed to me, brought it home after finished painting, and felt, God, I've I've, I've actually created an original piece of work here. Nobody else has done this before. This particular place. This is totally original. I'm really enjoying this, and I really enjoyed looking at the colours. And so I got hooked on it after that. So that decided my path after that. Yeah, well, that's incredible because what you've just said is basically a piece of grass in a cemetery. Yeah, was pro profound enough for you. There they are on the wall there, right behind you. Wow. They were the first. They were the things that made made me change. To, to do what I do now it just took that little bit of observation to change it so you didn't have that vision leaving Waterford you didn't no. really know I, I exactly done one or two landscapes to down there alright and I enjoyed them but because you're so immersed in other work uh, centred around the college the, like I enjoyed it but it was when I was on my own now you have to make a living or do something you know what are you going to do you know so that was I was trying out different things and that was the one that yeah this is it this is where this is where I belong because I felt I was back in the landscape out fishing or shooting this is this is where I this is m yeah. what I know yeah and come here now a very important question is um At what point then after that 
did you make your first sale? Uh, my father actually bought the first painting. How oh, lovely. Yeah, I was I was painting in a place out near Mornington. It's actually near Cope. Uh, there's a glen there with trees and a little stream running through it. So <clears throat> he was doing a call out that way. He was a, a GP. So he was doing a call and he dropped me there and he said, you can go up and I'll collect you later. So I went down and I spent about an hour or two down painting in the <clears throat> in the glen and back with the painting. And he liked it and he bought it. That was for 60 quid. Brilliant. <laughs> so I was delighted. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, an encouragement, but it was nice. Great to have it. Yeah. Of course, uh, because, you know, um, if you have the support of your family, it's, yeah, it makes things have, easier. Couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. It wouldn't yeah. have happened. Yeah. <clears throat> so with apologies, if the sound is a little bit different, because the batteries ran out and I'm now connected to mains power and... Uh, the recorder is slightly tilted. Uh, Richard, immediately after your father bought your first painting, we have to get on to talking about when was your next sale to perhaps a stranger or mm. someone who wasn't family? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't remember the... I don't remember the paintings that were sold after that. Um, I think Austin Green and... He was a, a local businessman and he had a big interest in art <clears throat> and the McCluskeys, um, the bakers and the, the, the honey crowd, uh, they took a big interest in the work I was doing. So they would buy quite regularly off me. And then there was a local vet, he, he had um, a big interest in the painting as well. So they seemed to take an interest in what we were doing, myself and Raphael and the, um, you know, we, we had been working in the landscape quite a bit and they got to know us and we had a few exhibitions around the place so we would have been selling work through that. So there's people that we knew or got to know us that liked art. And just for people who aren't uh, in Drogheda who are listening to this, Raphael Hines is another local artist. When, when did you befriend Raphael? <clears throat> Now, Raphael um, was introduced to me by a mutual friend, uh, Joe Farrell. He, Raphael was still in art college and Joe brought him up to the studio here to meet up with myself. So we had a chat and I said, you know, I was telling him about what I was doing and um, uh, he was working on a project in the National Gallery at the time. So he said to call up. And I said, yeah, sure, I will. So any excuse to go to National Gallery is always a good excuse. <laughs> so um, I went up and met up with Ray from we having a chat. And he said, I said to him, I want to show you my favourite painting. He said, no, no, I want to show you mine. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, OK, you show me your painting. So we're walking through the, the gallery. And I was, as we were walking through it, I realised he was coming closer to where I wanted to go. So I was... At least I don't have to walk miles back the other way. So we ended up in the same room. I said, oh, this is great. You know? And as he walked across the room, <clears throat> he got closer to the painting I wanted to show him. Now, this was an obscure Flemish painting by Gerard David, and it's called Christ Bidding Farewell to His Mother. Now, it's not an impression. It's, 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 it's a very humble painting but it's absolutely gorgeous. I thought it was gorgeous. <clears throat> and, and as we walked closer to the painting, he pointed, he pointed and said, there, 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 yeah, what do you think? I said, that's the blooming painting that I was going to show you. <laughs> I was flabbergasted because there's thousands of paintings in the gallery and I barely knew this chap. And when we looked at the painting, it was almost like, there's Jesus Christ saying, now boys, go ahead and paint. And... I had such a fruitful um, learning experience with Rayfield from that time on. Yeah. And I just felt, wow, that was such a coincidence. You know, of yeah. all the paintings in the gallery, we picked the same one. Extraordinary. It was just extraordinary. How many paintings are there, as a matter of fact? Oh, there's thousands. 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 I mean, I mean, I hardly knew the chap. But, so, to me, that was a spiritual saying, yes, now, go, 
go go paint. So you clicked. Ah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it was it was fascinating. And are you both the same age or? No, he's a couple of years younger. Okay. Yeah. So he was still in college. I was just finished. Um, yeah, it was just. But Rayfield has a very um, inquisitive mind and very analytical study. You know, why do you do things? Why does this? He's very much into the mathematical side of things. So we used to go out paint the landscapes quite a lot, and drawing was a big thing for him as well. Um, he's a great artist, I think. Um, now, now he works in the studio all the time. He doesn't go out. So we we went our separate ways that way, but he was finding his way and I was finding mine. So, but we learned so much from each other, and it was a great to get feedback off another artist, which is what I had missed in in college. It wasn't you know this is the thing I really liked is working with other artists. Um, so you can. What we do is we go out, do a few paintings, and come back. Put the stick the paintings up on the wall and have a chat, have a cup of tea, talk about what we saw, you know, what colours we mixed. Um, so we generally quizzed each other about, you know, why we were doing what we did. So, but as a result, you're learning more about who you are, why you do things, because you're being asked questions, which is great. You know, it's um, yeah, that was fascinating. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and we go to different places around that. I remember one day we were, we were painting up near the railway station, uh, and, and another friend, Andrew McKeown, he was with us. So I was painting one part of the wood, and they were painting another part. And he said, ah, we better go home for lunch and get something to eat and come back up. So, so we went home, and then when we come back up about an hour later, where Raphael and Andrew were standing, a feckin' tree had fallen right on where they were, so they couldn't finish the painting. Mm. If they had stayed, this wow. tree would have fallen on top of them. Crikey. If, it was, if we hadn't gone home, yeah, might have been killed. So, so, weird stuff like that, you know. That is weird, all right. Isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> how, how long after you left college did you get introduced to Rayfield? Uh, I think it was about six, seven months later. So and then... Long. You, you painted a lot together for a while, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, up and down the rivers and up to the, the garden. The nuns had a lovely garden up the back, so we did an awful lot of painting in there because you wouldn't be disturbed by anyone. Yeah. And they didn't mind us painting, so that was another godsend, you know. Yeah, that's up behind your house here. <coughs> yeah, yeah, so they look beautiful apple trees and they had lovely flowers in the garden all year round, you know. Yeah. So. You could just go up any time, and you could nearly you could leave the easel there overnight if you wanted, and you come back in the morning, just continue on. And like you, obviously, the nuns found that yeah, they like loveliness that. in yeah. nature. Yeah. Yeah. How important! I mean, the the listeners will hear the traffic, and of course, the Dublin Road is busier than it ever was, and it's always been a busy thoroughfare, the main road in through Drogheda. But um, how important is the local? area around you to your work <clears throat> it's um it's where i live um it's where i grew up in so i know the place very well and i had um within walking distance you could go to the fields where there were haystacks there was a river there was trees there was you know there was all sorts of things around the place within walking distance so they didn't need a car yeah but um, that's all gone now. It's a, the development over the last forty years. That's all gone now. There's all buildings everywhere now. So yeah, it's not it's not the same. I, that 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 was a, a killer blow for me. I I, I felt I lost a lot of um, natural environment for me to work in. So I had to move further out of town to get that quietness and natural cycle of life. You see, I love the change in landscape with the seasons. You know, you're from spring to autumn, winter, and you're looking at the same place, but it changes so much. It's 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 just brilliant, you know. Yeah. Um. 
just I don't know, it's just, it's, it's different now, you know. I think I, it became very materialistic, the whole environment. Yeah. Everything was, uh, I remember even not being too happy seeing the first traffic lights being brought into town. <laughs> they're everywhere way. now, of yeah, course. Yeah, they're everywhere, but there was, there was very few traffic lights around then. It just meant it was, it was, urbanisation was getting more, it, it, was, it was losing its natural quality. Um, and that affected you, obviously. It does, yes. It, because you, you. I mean, if I wanted to live in a city, I would have moved into Dublin. But uh, I'm not a city person. I like going in now and again to a city, but um, I'd rather walk a, a field with ditches and birds and dragonflies and insects mm. and all that natural life. I see. Were your parents local, or where were they from? My father was from Castle Blaney in County Monaghan, and my mother was from uh, Waterford. Um, oh, what's the bloody name of the place? It's outside Waterford. It's about 14. Kill, Kill, Kill McThomas okay. in County Waterford. That's a so place with a, vi a railway viaduct. That's right. Yeah. So, so in essence, when you were when you were going to Waterford, you were in a, in a way you were going home. Yes. You were going to an environment that wasn't necessarily immediately familiar to you, but was part of your story, I suppose. Well, do you know something? Drawed is very like Waterford. It has a it has that normal Norman background. You know, you have Reginald's Tower down there. We have Lawrence's Gate. Uh, Hugh de Lacey, the founder of Drogheda, as it as in its present form. Uh, you had that Norman influence in Waterford as well, and the the buildings and the town were kind of laid out similar. So I felt at home down there straight away. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, apart from the fact that I had relatives there as well. Yeah, which yes. may, probably made things a little bit easier. Oh, much easier. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that the fact that your parents weren't from Drogheda had that any influence at all on you? <clears throat> uh, I suppose you were born here, though. Were I you? was born here. Yeah. yeah so. so. You would consider yourself a Drogheda man through oh, yeah. and through. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that change too, and I agree. Like, you know, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, there were 20,000 people in Drogheda. Now I think there are 45,000. And um, it has, as you say, it's become commercial. I think was life a... was perhaps a little bit simpler in, say, the 70s and the 80s, and also the pace of life was slower. Oh, it's much slower, yeah, because... People when people went to work, uh, they, you know it was busy at nine o'clock, quiet from then on until one o'clock, and then it was busy, and then from two o'clock on it was quiet again until six. So there was that kind of order and structure in the town. Now there's it's just it's like watching a, a version of ER or something. It's just this madness that's mm -hmm. busy, busy, busy. I remember painting at the top of Peter Street one day during the, the boom and traffic was jammed for say half ten or eleven in the morning. I remember one of the guards coming over and I was saying to him, I said, I've seen this van, you know, it was probably an electrician or a builder's van here about an hour ago and everybody's booming but nobody's working. They're all sitting in cars stuck in traffic. I said, it doesn't make any sense to me. How, are they, how, is anyone, <laughs> how is anyone making bloody money if they're not working, you know? Yeah, they'd be better walking, would they? Yeah, <laughs> oh, much better, yeah. But it was just, it was crazy, crazy. It was all, they were all running around like headless chickens, doing, you know, for what? Because before there was a job to go to, just, just you kind of, there was order and structure. Now there was nothing. It was all mayhem and nonsense I, I just it just didn't make sense to me yeah um yeah people who grow up in cities you know modern cities won't have that appreciation but i suppose we, we've gone in the space of your lifetime we have seen you see you knew you, you knew most people that you met on the town you know you had an idea who who they were where they were from um you could have conversations. And because my father was a GP, 
uh, he had a lot of patients around the town. So there was a, again, the, the, there was that interaction of meeting all these people. You know, when they'd be coming to the surgery, I sometimes would have to do answering the door. You know, so you were meeting an awful lot of people. The door was always open, you know. Yeah. And then my my sisters and my brothers, they had friends coming in. So there was a constant flow of people coming into the house and engage. It was a real community, if you like. Um, nowadays, um, you're lucky if you see someone coming into the in the door now at all. Yeah. So it's just it's 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 totally different. Mm. Um, and not in a good way necessarily. Not in a good way, no. It, it, was there a particular reason your father came from Casa? Was it work that brought him to Drogheda? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was originally based in Dundalk, uh, in the the hospital there, and then he, he opened up a practice in Fair Street in Drogheda, um, and he met my mother. She had been working as a a book a bookie in the bookie's office. She came up with my sister, uh, her sister from Waterford and they worked in Powers Bookies so they would have been socialising so they met up here in Drogheda and have got married then so they lived in Fair Street for the first couple of years he had a surgery there oh ok I didn't and know then, that um, he, bought the, he came over to the Dublin Road then he, they were renting the house here and he eventually bought it so from the nuns they used to own all these houses here it was originally owned by um, Towney Hall, the Towney Blaney Balfour family. Ah. So these, this house was built in 1845. <clears throat> so wow, just before it has the a long famine. history, yeah. Yeah. So lovely house. Plus, um, Full of character, yeah. Yeah. A typical Georgian red yeah. bricked three yeah. story over a basement, or is it four? Yes, three, three story over a basement. Yeah. Sort of building you see all over the place in Dublin City. Yeah, it, does. Uh, it was a great house as a kid because he, he used to play, get a torch, switch off all the lights and play, you know, explore around the house. It was great fun, you know, it was a great house for hide and seek and yeah. all that stuff. So, yeah. you know, you know. not, not really your typical, a lot of people grow up in, 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 in Ireland over the past half century, have grown up in either cottages or in, yeah. in, in two or three bed uh, uh, terraced houses or three bed semis, you know. Yeah. It's a little I bit know, different. This is, this is totally different, yeah. But in a good way. <clears throat> yeah. So, at what point, um, say, say you know, ha having left college and you were painting with Brayfield, at what point then do you remember striking out on your own, as it were, like doing your own thing and sort of interacting with Brayfield less and finding your feet? Well, um, <clears throat> Rayfield started getting interested in doing portraits, so he, he got himself a studio across town, right beside the Lawrence's Gate, um, upstairs. So he... He was breaking out then to his own thing, and then he got married and they bought a house and he built it on the studio. So he he did most of his still lives from there and uh, portraits, and then he just in the la last couple of years he's been just doing still lives only, but they <clears throat> they take about six months to complete. Yeah, absolutely rigid observation. Six months. <clears throat> yeah, at for least one painting. One painting, yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, astonishing depth of observation in them. Yeah. Wouldn't be everybody's cup of tea, but no. but the, I, for me, they're absolutely amazing. Yeah. So obviously, when <clears> this <throat> happened, you kind of you had found your grow, which seems to have been for the outdoors. Yeah. And you kept going at that. I kept going at that. Yeah. So. So. I've been happy with that ever since. So, um, but then that brought us. Uh, I started to move outside the town much more, and that's where I started getting interested in the areas where we used to do a lot of fishing. <clears throat> and that would have brought me up to New Newgrange and out that way, and RD and Talents Town, all these other outlying towns. So, when I got a car, I used to go travelling everywhere within all these places yeah so um you had a bit more freedom to explore once you had the wheels under you oh yeah it's great when yeah. when did you get your first car can you remember uh i was shortly after i got married to, um we needed a car to have you know we had a 
Elizabeth then. So we got a mobile home out at um, Queenstown and Claw Ahead, so we needed a car, so that's when I got a car, so. Yeah, but you probably found that opened up whole new, a oh, whole yeah. new area for you in terms oh, of yeah, your art. Oh yeah, the freedom was great, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a particular, I mean, this is going to, so, so, <clears> such an arbitrary question. Um, is there a particular length of time that you find is ideal for a painting? In other words, you, you, you don't do a painting in an hour, but would you spend several weeks doing one or what's the sort of ideal length of time or have you found it doesn't matter? Just it de No, it doesn't matter. It just depends on the, on the place, uh, what you want to get from it. Oh, uh, th there's no, there's no, I can't tell whether it's going to be a long painting or a short one. So you could start off something, you could do it in an hour and it would turn out perfect. You could do it in weeks, but you still, you still, the quality is still there. You know, there's no, there's no, um, gee, I don't know. Yeah. And that's what I like about it, because I don't know. It's, it's a journey for me. Yeah, there's no strict regimen around the whole thing. No, I don't. I don't work to. See, it's best not to put um, container. You know, not to, not to restrict yourself. I always allow allow for something else to happen because I don't know what's going to happen. So um, you just leave the thing open to in case something crop, crop comes up and you say, "Oh, I didn't see that before." No, that's another avenue I can have a look at. Um, yeah. When did you have your first exhibition of work? <clears throat> oh yeah, the first exhibition was with um, with Rachel Hines and Andrew McKeown. The three of us had been working, that was 1981. And we had it in the local music shop called The Sound Shop. Uh, we had about 60, 70 paintings in it. <clears throat> and we asked Tommy Leddy, could we have the upstairs room? And he said, yeah, no problem. And I said, but we need to have it open in the evening time, on, on a Friday evening. He said, no problem. He said, I keep the shop open. So that was grand. So we had a big opening and loads of people had come in and we had a good, we sold quite a few. Brilliant. And I was asking Tommy, yeah, well, how did it, you know, was it okay? And he said, Gee, so that was great. See, I sold three pianos. <laughs> See, so he continued to open up on a Friday evening after that. Oh, yeah, because he, he was getting more customers. <laughs> so, so, so you guys were the reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah I thought it was very funny. That he extended his business hours. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so. And so I, I suppose, was there a nervousness around oh, exhibiting yeah. publicly for the first time? Yeah. Yeah, there always is because yeah. you you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you try to do everything right, get everything catalogued, printed, and all ready, and the press notified about the exhibition, so that as many people will find out of where it is and what's on, you know. So it went very well. So that was the first exhibition. It was called a celebration of life, and that name came about because we had an uncle who was a priest, Father Terry. Hines, and we had been discussing about what to call the exhibition and he'd heard us talking about all the landscapes we did and the way we worked and he said do you know something he said I feel you fellas are celebrating life and it might be nice to call it a celebration of life so I said perfect so that's that was the title of it brilliant yeah, <clears throat> yeah. so and how much, um, you just mentioned a priest there, yeah, which sort of prompts me to ask the inevitable about, you know, your beliefs and your religion. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, I know I don't have to ask because I know you, but for the people who don't know you, yeah. um, that has been an influence for you. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't know, as a, as a kid, um, I didn't have a problem believing in God, you know. I just, it, there was, there's so many things happened in my life um, that it just leads me to believe that um, things that shouldn't happen do happen, and, you know. There's a lot of weird stuff uh, has happened. I won't 
talk about them now, but maybe at another stage. But, um, yeah, there's, there's no doubt. And for in, me. In, in terms of then how that actually became incorporated into your work, have you, you've done, I mean, I know you have, because <coughs> I've seen some of them, you've done religious paintings. Yeah, I have one painting there. Um, it's it's called Genesis. It's to do with this the six days of creation. It's just it's a figure of God the Father, and I've got a friend of mine to pose. Got a nice big blonde beard, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I got a, I borrowed a Franciscan habit, and so I have him holding a crucifix and a candle representing the Trinity. You know, the crucifix is obviously Jesus, the Father is the figure holding it and then the candle is the Holy Spirit or the light and that comes from a Van, a Van, der, a Van Eyck painting called uh, The Marriage of Anna. There was a couple getting married and they had this symbolism was in the background in the in the what do you call it the light above he had a candle a single candle representing the presence of Jesus in the room or stuff like that you know so there was so I like that Renaissance type and early Flemish art that you, they go into the symbolism by using certain things to represent the religious thing. And another painting I did was um, the creation of Adam and Eve. And I did four, six foot by four paintings outside in the garden, using the garden of the nuns as the Garden of Eden. And I have them, the Trinity in the primary colours of light which was red, green and blue because, you know, let there be light and God is light and all that kind of stuff. So I was playing around with that idea of colour and uh, one of the nuns came up to me and said, have you ever heard of um, this Russian artist, um, uh, hey, when that happens the name's gone, Rublev. Um, and he did this painting of the Trinity and he had the same colours, red, green and blue. And I was, oh, I haven't heard of this fella before. So I was right, I was intrigued, but he picked the same colours, but for different reasons. I was picking it for, because of, it was the primary colours of light. So that was another big pain. I didn't finish it because um, um, I was trying to... <laughs> I wanted to do Eve in the garden, so uh, Eve wouldn't have had any clothes on. So I was trying to do uh, Adam on one side of the tree and Eve on the other, which was based on the idea, and you know Murdoch's cross out in Monaster Boyce? Yes. You know the Adam and Eve panel where they're on either side of the tree? The tree. And, yeah. The so, apple. Yeah. You know, whatever the fruit was. And I was basing it around that idea, so I wanted to have a figure on either side of the actual apple tree up there. So... Uh, was it just having, that you couldn't get a model, need, I, I or was it just that the nun sensitivities would have been aroused? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't get around that, and I, I, yeah, I didn't really. I must. I'll get around to it someday. I'll get a model in the mm. future and try and finish it. But that was nineteen eighty, so. Well, it's forty years in the making so far. So far, I'll just do another one. Yeah, <laughs> the artist's labours. Yeah, that was the other thing too. When you come back to draw it. Um, I used to get people to ask me, oh, um, do you go to our college? Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, do you, do you, you know, do you ever, um, it's a bit like a Monty Python sketch, you know, um, do you ever do um, the nude? I said, yeah, yeah, why? Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> They're all but getting... They offer, of, offer themselves up as models? No, no, no. They were, they were, <laughs> this would be people sort of wondering, you know, the idea of painting a girl in the nude was was like oh my god you know yeah very prude and so and things kind of, were a bit more conservative back then extremely yeah. conservative yeah. see i'm so used to going in every day just drawing the model and you know you don't think anything of it you know there's nothing it's, it's just art it's not but this these page three mentality yeah. coming at you it's just um it put me off actually doing it so for a long time so um that was that was a bit of a bummer you know yeah, <laughs> excuse the pun. Yes, yeah, exactly. But uh, uh, no, but they've started up our life drawing classes again, so I'm able to get back to the the model again. So I'm I'm enjoying that. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so. So, is there any area in art that you won't go to? Is there anything that's taboo for you? 
Well, I don't know. Um, Subject-wise, you do landscapes, you do portraiture, you do still life, you yeah. do you do paintings that have no colour in them. Yeah. Um, you've done pencil and charcoal, but I mean, in terms of subject, there isn't anything in particular that you wouldn't. You probably wouldn't paint a car. Well, I've ha- well, I have to paint them. Well, I mean, you know, just a car. Oh yeah, yeah, just a car on its own. No. Yeah. It wouldn't wouldn't interest me. I'm not a. You now there was a lad in college that used to love painting cars, and that was that was his thing. So, yeah. Yeah. But then, no, each to their own, you know. And I'm just more on, on the nature side of things rather than. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, if something interests me, I'll paint it. You know. So. Yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, I. <laughs> I do some weird stuff as well. Um, I've gone in to paint St. Oliver Plunkett's head. I got permission off the Bishop Lennon at the time. And I went in and did a painting of his portraits. <laughs> I say that's probably the, the first time a portrait of a saint has been done. Yeah. Just, um, just for those who are listening who don't know who we're talking about, in the parish church on the main street in Drogheda, uh, in, in a glass box, on display, on public display, is the head of St. Oliver Plunkett, who was martyred at uh, Tyburn in London in the 17th century, 1600s. Yeah. Um, and if it, you know, it, it can be a shocking thing. I mean, oh, it is, yeah. you know, you're seeing, you're, you're seeing, it's, 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 it is in a way grotesque, but uh, Richard, you're probably the sort of person who sees beauty in grotesqueness as well. Well, the fascinating thing about this painting, this man's head, is while I, while I was painting, it was, uh, you know, you're studying a part of the forehead and then you move on to the eye uh, and then your mouth and so on. But when I was painting the forehead, I noticed this extreme agony in the f- expression. And I was kind of shocked by that. I said, wow, you know, and then as I moved down and I did some part of the side of the face there, there was this smile of pure ecstasy you could see in the face. And I was I was astonished at two extreme expressions, agony and ecstasy in the one face. So that was St. Oliver Plunkett. So it was almost like the moment, the extreme pain he was going through while he was being martyred, and then the sudden release of when death took him, the, 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 you could see heaven, you know that? Yeah, that moment of release, mm. and you know that. And how, the, how long were you doing that painting? Uh, it was a few evenings. I didn't. I I just did the face, the head only. I didn't do the surrounding area, so it's it's kind of left blank around the edge, and then. But I've also done a drawing, so that would have an afternoon. Of course, he met with a horrible death. I think at that time the typical. Execution was was hung. He was hung, drawn, and quartered. Was he? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and then I think they burned the body afterwards. Yeah, they, they threw the body into a fire. But uh, somebody, some some people pulled the uh, the remains out and took them away as yeah. relics. Yeah. But that's that is that'll be another branch of what I do. So. Yeah. Um, Did you get anybody coming up to you in the church? In, in, in intrigued or no I think people when they come into a church they kind of mind their own business mm, yeah so, but yeah. on the street by contrast people approach you quite all, oh, quite, yeah. quite regularly tell me about some of those encounters right um, I was outside the Augustinian church in Shop Street in Drogheda and I was doing a painting of the Thosel which is the, the big clock up the street and I was almost finished it was actually finished and I was talking to a lad on the street just as I was wrapping up and this guy came out of the pub he was about 40 years of age he staggered over and oh what are you doing he says and I said well have a look uh, it was pretty obvious what I was doing and he said I oh he says I think you should put and he stuck his finger in the white p- paint and he, st- he dabbed it on the paint and he said I think you should put a white thing there you know <laughs> and the other fellow that was standing on the other side of the wall said oh you're effing this and you shouldn't leave that paint you shouldn't do that and he, there was nearly a row breaking out and I said stop 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 and I said you really shouldn't have done that he said and I just so I wiped off the paint what he'd done 
and he said, oh, he's only this and he's only that, you know, I can't repeat the words. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> he said, uh, and then he stopped for a second, he said, oh, well, how much, how much would you get for that paint? And I said, I looked at him straight and he said, 900 euros. And he said, oh, 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 and he, he backed off, oh, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed because he had no respect for the painting, right? Until but you put a value on but it. But suppose I put that when I put that figure of money, I was shocked by the fact that that money was more important mm. than what was being done. And, and it was a bit of a, that was an eye opener for me. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a yeah. That was. But that doesn't happen very often. I have no, to say. no, I can't imagine it does, because most of your encounters, I'm sure, are friendly. <laughs> they are, yeah. Uh, especially now, some of the alcoholics over the years that would come over uh, would be fascinated by what's going on. And they come over every day just to see how it was getting on. And, and how's, my, how's the painting coming along? And, oh, that's lovely. You know? And it seemed to lift them out of their misery just for that moment. Um, so I, I was happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were, and they're generally very nice people. You know, it when just they're hit even on hard even, times, yeah. yeah it's just they're, they're, they're tortured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, and then there's another time um, this guy came over and it was 11 o'clock in the morning, he was, he was jarred. And well, was for asking, him, huh? <laughs> yeah. But God love him. Um, he came over and he was asking about the paints and I said, where are you from? And he said he was from Russia. And I said, um, what? Oh, he said, I said, what were you doing when you were in Russia? And he said, I was a soldier. And I said, oh my God. I said, where did you serve? In Afghanistan. And um, he started to cry. He'd seen things. I can and imagine, could, yeah. yeah. And you could feel the pain. And had he had he broken English? Yeah, <clears throat> you could speak all right, but the pain, the pain. Mm. You might have been the first person he'd, he'd had a proper conversation with. Yeah, I think so. But I get a lot of people coming up to me like that. Yeah, well, it would strike me, I know you a long time, it would strike me that you're a very compassionate sort of individual, sort of person that people, you have a friendly air about you that people feel that they could sort of come up and have a conversation and tell you things that maybe they haven't told other people. Yeah, well, that that was one. Yeah, he was, he was, he was. That was that was hard. Yeah. And I said, you really need to talk to somebody, you know. So yeah. He he couldn't talk. He had to walk. He walked away. He just couldn't. He couldn't continue. Yeah. And I was I was very shocked by that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Like war is a oh yeah, it was horrible, shockingly yeah. horrible yeah. thing. So that things was, that, that was that humans was... do to each other in the name of war and flags and nationalism yeah. and all that. Yeah, he, he was yeah that that hit hard, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. But then you've had a lot of nice. I mean, I I don't mind telling the listeners that I met you on the street. That's right. On my way to work. Yeah. Speaking of habits, you know. Mm. And uh, like that, I stopped. And I would say definitely I would have had that impression just from looking at you that you were the sort of fellow that, you know, because not everyone's like that. No. You know, you couldn't disturb everybody at, who's at work and start a chat with them, you know. Well, I, I always think if, if people want to learn about art, you know, it's not a bad thing. And I, I feel that if I'm there they can learn something. You know, it might take them away from their whatever it is that moment. Uh, so they see something going on, a creative process going on. So if they're walking past every day, they can see something building up. And it's kind of interesting. You know, yeah. people love watching stuff on TV and painters doing their bits and pieces. But here, here they can see their own, they can see the environment that it's been happening in. And then they can, they can see the progress every day. So they, they become curious and ask questions and you generally get a life story out of them as well. So, Do you think that there's um, 
I'm just asking because I don't really know the answer, but do you think there's perhaps a little bit of a lack of education about the importance of art? Um, but they just don't know, you know. It's just, mm. it's sometimes uh, it's not just taught in schools. It, it, it's it's um, not very many people do what I'm doing, you know. Yeah, because um, this isn't Paris. No. You know... Um, you know, this isn't um, Florence or Rome or one of the great cities of Europe where, you know, street artists are probably much more plentiful. This is Ireland yeah. with all the vagaries, and the cap capricious nature of our weather and everything else. I suppose, but what's different, I think in Paris, they're, they're usually painting stuff that's out of their heads m most of the time. There'd be very few people actually painting the subject matter in front of them. So what I'm doing is, is I'm recording something in life that's right beside them that's actually going on at the moment. So the, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm just making them look at their own environment they're, because they're seeing me see something that they've never looked at. So it's, it, maybe it's just giving them time to reflect on what's around them. I don't know. Yeah. You were in the back lanes when I met you. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'll be honest, I would have thought that the back lanes was a very dull and unimportant and yeah. sort of not very attractive scene for a painting. And yet there you were happily ensconced. What did you see down there? That It was the, the, the view of Lawrence's Gate from, and it was the old buildings around us. And it was just, a, it was a composition that intrigued me. Um, just the the the, way, the lie of the land. There was a hill there, so it's just a composition. It was interesting, um, interesting part of town for me. I don't like to do the the obvious, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's not a surprise anymore, you know. Yeah, and perhaps it's cliched and all the rest. Yeah, you can see the you can see paintings done at the same buildings over and over again, but I like to just have a look from from a different angle. Yeah, you know, again, that surprise element of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah, and you were very, <clears throat> as I remember, uh, engaging. You weren't um, standoffish. No. I, I just stopped and said hello and started chatting. And no, you were there curious. There was a conversation. Yeah, I like curious people. It's a, it's a, I think it's a very good um, trait for an artist who's, who is painting streetscapes because I'm conscious of it now as a photographer that over the years I've had people come up to me and ask me what I'm doing. Yeah. And I remember one time when I was perhaps a little bit more rash and perhaps a little bit less sort of patient when, when, I, when I turned to the individual in question I said, I'm taking a photograph because <laughs> it, it was really obvious what I yeah. was doing. But... I was immature, I suppose, not mature enough to, to actually tell him, well, well, let's talk for a moment about the composition and yeah. the technique and what I'm hoping to achieve in the end image, you know. Because you t you're, they're learning something too. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's some fascinating people out there. Well, everybody... I think I'll, it, I'll tell you another good one. I was on Long Street as well, and it, I had to do the street early in the morning because there'd be less cars on the street, so... Yeah. Um, it was about half eight and this girl came out from one of the flats and she said oh I saw you there and she had a hot dog and she cooked a little hot dog for me and she said I thought she looked cold and I thought she might like something to eat to keep you warm lovely so things like that happen yeah or in another place I was out in the street and a woman came out with a cup of tea just to keep me going and said if you want anything I'll just give me a shout you know this kind of this the kind of interaction you meet people are very kind you know mm. yeah i don't know it's just it kind of brings out the best in people I suppose. it does yeah but you have to be receptive you see that's yeah i think they they it's almost like they know that before they speak to you mm. you know i suppose they look they know by your aura your the look on your face i suppose yeah yeah so in essence the artist isn't just painting you're sort of recording life in, I think, in many uh, different ways. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, I think people feel safe. 
uh, and the see me painting on the street. I think it, it lends an air of, you know, this is an okay place. It's not a dangerous place. Mm. No, there's yeah, nothing yeah. threatening about it. Didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I seem to calm them. Well, I would say you are a calm person. You have a calming influence, which yeah. probably helps. Yeah. It was an interesting point. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. People see an artist on the street, they think, hmm, this must yeah, be an just... okay place to be then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it reinforces it because I, um, we'll take another break in a moment, but when, when we come back, I want to talk about your new work and, and looking at everything that's happened over the years. Um, but it's those perhaps mundane corners where there's still sort of excitement and there's still vividness and there's still life, you know? Yeah, people yeah, people are going from A to B, as I'm always saying. They don't have time to look. Yeah. But when they see me standing there looking, they, they see the place for the first time because they haven't looked at it before. So I'm just giving them time to look and point out things that I see and, oh, do you know such and such a thing is over there? See the colour of that building? It's lovely with the, the other colours around it, you know. Yeah. And that's why I choose this particular spot, because it has something that appeals to me, you know. You become aware of the intricate <coughs> details that other people never see. Yeah. It's, I've always known that about you. Cause yeah, see, when you stand, you stand in one spot for hours, you're mm -hmm. going to see things that, obviously, and that comes from fishing and you're out in the landscape. No. Yeah, but yeah. I, would, I would say that you wouldn't, as a photographer, you wouldn't see that detail because you're not there long enough. It's it's when you have to record that detail onto a canvas mm. or onto a board that you, you see yeah. the full detail of it. Yeah, I like to, like I'm, I'm painting the river downtown, the, the tide comes in and out. So you yeah, have seen the place changing and, you know, the colours are changing and then... The ripples on the water have patterns and it's fascinating. Um, so when the tide's in, it's totally different. There's a calmness and then when the tide's out, the dark colours of the, the river and the weeds and it's it's just astonishing. Mm. I happen to think that Trahut is a town full of character. Oh, it's great, yeah. It's great I, I think it's one of the best towns. It's I've had photographers from Navan who've told me We'd love to come over to Drogheda to do a night or in a day and a, a night of photography because Navan just doesn't have those. I suppose Drogheda being built on two hills overlooking a river and having that norm and history and having so many structures and yeah. things lit up yeah. uh, and old bits of town wall and 17th and 18th century buildings. and You have a sense of... of like say in this house now, there's been families living here, living here for over a hundred years or two, mm -hmm. and I I sometimes like to sit in the room and I wonder who was here a hundred a hundred years ago. Yeah. And yeah. what there was what was going on, what conversations went on. It's amazing. It's just mm -hmm. fascinating. They like they started living among ghosts, you know. Yeah. And not that I've seen any, but um, <laughs> but you have a sense of. You have more of a sense of belonging. There's a sense of um, you're in a in a in a in a in a nice place, in a warm place. It's because people have lived in it. Yeah, lives have come and go. It's, you know, there's a, there's a lovely sense of belonging. Well, if it's 1845, that's actually 175 years. Yeah, which is the nuns used to live in this house. I remember we were getting um, rewiring the house and we had to lift up floorboards and I found little notes that the nuns had been written, uh, had written prayers on and they were wrapped up and obviously I d somehow they ended up under the floorboards. Yeah. So I, I gave them to the local priest and he was fascinated by the, the little notes in it. So, I don't know. It's not every day people find that. No type of history in their house no because when you see the note with the handwritten note and you say god almighty you know somebody was writing this out here all those years ago yeah probably long gone you know yeah yeah like little messages in time you know mm. <clears throat> it makes it's it's better you know 
<clears throat> there's more there, there, there's it makes sense in some way you know and sometimes you, you're not sure you know I don't know it's, 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 yeah. I suppose the other thing is you have to kind of you have to kind of live the life that you uh, you envision for yourself you know yeah, but sometimes you don't, know, you don't know what it is. Well, at the moment, it's kind of you kind of reach a stage. Of, I've, I'm, I'm at an age where it's a bit confusing for me at the moment because I'm. Uh, I don't know. Just I'm at a crossroads at the moment, so I don't know. If, like. The inevitable is on, not too far away, you know. That is, you have to move on. So I'm trying to make the most of what I have now. I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, it's a weird place to be at the moment. Is that just, do you think, related to your age? Yeah. It's a kind of... S Realization, I suppose, that is natural mm. when one b begins to head towards the autumn of one's life. Yeah. That there's an in inevitability about it. Yeah. So, so something that you said there off camera, so to speak, was, you know, that death is a, a great uh, teacher in a way. Uh, wakes you up. You know... We were just talking in, during a, a little break there about how so many people don't fulfill themselves and don't reach their, you know, their potential in life. You certainly couldn't be described as that sort of person. Um... <clears throat> Oh, it's I'm at a crossroads really. Um, it's you see, I'm on. I live on my well. I'm not living on my own totally. I have somebody here. They're renting a place, so there's somebody in the house. But it's it's sort of um, it's nice to have the company in the house. You know, yeah, yeah. but um, it's too it's. It's, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a, I'm sort of at a crossroads where I'm not sure which way I'm going now. All I know is that if I write the book, that's keeping me focused for the moment. Uh, I know I have to record and put it down the last so many years of my life, what happened, who I, who I met and people that I dealt with. So I'm trying to keep some sort of record of this period of my life. But I'm trying to include those that were around me and the influence they had on me and how I got to where I am. And I'm just I'm trying to show a gratitude for for this life. Now uh, you have you have your ups and downs. But when you're down you sort of realise things that are not Things certainly are not that just that important anymore, mm. and you're trying to trying to find what the, what value do I have now, or where what can I do now that can add to that or make use of. Um, sorry, it's just it's just that I'm not sure at the moment. I'm just doing what I have to do at the moment to try and get me from you know from this period of life to the next period whatever yeah, that is but that's perfectly normal mm. perfectly normal yeah nothing unusual about that no. nothing to apologize for either no you know yeah, i mean life has phases doesn't it it does have phases yeah so uh, i'm in a quiet phase at the moment yeah uh, i'm sort of gathering my thoughts and or where's the where is the next direction i'm going in uh, so it's just, it's just I'm unsure at the moment, that's all. But that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because from this uh, 
period undoubtedly will be born some greater realization and a new pathway mm. probably won't be that new in fairness it would oh. probably still involve art anyway of course <laughs> <laughs> So you you're working at the moment, Richard, on producing a book. I want you to tell me a little bit more about that. Okay. Well, many years ago, I I, I knew what we were doing as a group was important, and having looked at previous um, artists in history and how much I enjoyed reading about their life, I thought maybe it would be interesting to record a what. I, the life I've had, you know, it may not be of interest to a lot of people, but um, at least if I have it written down, it's there for anyone that wants to to look at it later. At least there's some record of this period of life. Um, yeah, there's not really much more I can say. Um, yeah. It's mainly I've had a quick look at a an early draft yeah. on the computer and it's it's wonderfully descriptive in that it's mainly pictures and the pictures will do the talking of course yeah yeah um i have paintings of the lads are painting and photographs of the places these places are no longer, uh, some of them are no longer there, so, and I'm trying to recall the enjoyment that was we had at the time, and the excitement of exploring new ground for ourselves, and this this sort of journey of surprises. Um, uh, I can't really... Yeah. But it's much more than that, because as I was saying, it's like a chronicle of not just your life and times, but it's a chronicle of the history of the town and how much a place has changed. And Change is inevitable. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's like a contrast, you know, like if you have dark, dark shapes uh, with bright shapes, there's something happens you know there's a it's nice to have a yin, a yin and yang in the story um you have the good times you have the bad times you have things that are astonishing to have been there and to have met these people and the effect that they have and the way you know you're, you're going in one direction suddenly is something opens up it's a whole new world and then you go and explore that and make astonishing discoveries on the way you know yeah just because you're sort of examining the landscape and people and asking questions I ask a lot of questions and it's a bit it's kind of like forensics uh where you go and have a look at the place and see well what happened here why why did that why would why did they build this house here? Why did people do that? Uh, it's interesting the answers that come up. Very surprising. Can you give me any examples? Um Oh where do I begin? <laughs> um, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to get a, a, a latch on something that's sort of interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, years ago, um, my brother was out sailing with a friend of his, and there was a race going from here, t from the Boyne Yacht Club to Rockabill and back. And they got lost on the way and were drowned and were picked up some time after that. But that was a, a huge experience for me. And yeah, I had some dreams before that, and they were kind of in a way pointing away but I didn't know that at the time and it was only until many years later that th those dreams made sense they were kind of um, a precursor uh, of what we were doing would make sense in the in the end 
And so what happened to me at that time pushed me in one direction, which made me start to look at things differently. So, like I say, that's when, when death happens, you have a totally different perspective of life. And you begin to see things in a, a totally different way. And the value of life goes up because it's, you realise it's only here for a short time, so you've got to, you know, what's it all about? You know, what's going on? And you try to make sense of it in, in whatever way you can. So my way was through painting and working in the landscape. Um, yeah, so this particular dream, <clears throat> um, it, it, it was me sitting in the boat coming up the River Boyne near the Maiden Tower, which is at, beside the estuary. And I'm sitting in the boat and I'm looking over the side of the boat into the water and the water was crystal clear and the Boyne was never clean at that time so yeah that's right it was a it was always mucky so this dream was very strange that the fact that i could see right down to the bottom so as i was looking over my father was sailing the boat up and as i was looking into the water i could see a fetus yeah so oh my god i better so i dived in to try and get it because i said my, my father could do something because being a doctor he'd be able to save it you know and I couldn't find it, and I was swimming around, and then this thing appeared underwater. So I, I swam towards that and into it, and then um, my ears popped, and next thing I'm on the beach, but I'm 40 years of age. Now, I'm only 16 when I'm having this dream. And what, so when I'm on the beach, uh, there's a girl sitting beside me. Now, I knew she was somebody I knew, but I didn't know who she was and my father was gone, the boat was gone and in behind me then there was this corrugated fencing all the way along the, the bank between me and the Maiden Tower and in the back of it I felt it was a huge building project that had started but had failed and everything had stopped and it was as if all the evil in the world had been pulled off it and there was this immense peace all around and that's where the dream stopped. But years later, um, I did sit on that beach with my daughter. Hmm. And my father was was dead at that point. So it was kind of a, a, a prophecy in a way. But the... So we, since that, we've had the building boom. Mm -hmm. Everything is gone. Everything the, has changed. The building boom followed by yeah. the economic collapse. Yeah. yeah. Now... The boat, uh, the name of the boat was called a Satanta. And when my brother was sailing to, and his friend Derek Carney, they were sailing to Rockabill and back. They got lost at that point. And it was years later um, that myself and yourself uh, discovered the Beltray alignment to Rockabill. Yeah. And to me, that was where that where the boat was on the river is in that line from from the Beltray Stones to Rockabill and it's exactly on that line. So the dream and the name of the boat, Satanta, which is where it led into the mythology. Yeah. But it was strange that the first discovery we ever made was from the Beltray Stone yes. pointing to Rockabill. In 1999. Yeah. Which is the year we properly met. Yeah. After our, a few years after I'd met you when yeah. you were painting, you were <clears throat> properly introduced and yeah. began a, an epic voyage, which we're going to talk about in the next yeah. episode. That That is really peculiar, though, isn't it? Yeah. You think that the, the dream was a, a psychic vision? Of some it was, kind? I think. Yeah. Because yeah, it makes sense now. Mm. It didn't make sense at the time. I remember even saying it to my brother about the dream about six months before this happened. And he said, oh, it's probably the load of cheese you had give me all these weird dreams <laughs> you see the dream was a repetitive one so but that wasn't the only one the other one was um i was i was in this round building it was white all in the inside 
and I remember standing in the in the middle of the room, and there was this huge lace curtain from the from upstairs, and there was a spiral staircase in the building. And I remember looking up, and you knew, you knew it was really sunny outside, and um, so I went out the back, and when I went out through the door, the sun was setting, and there were seven headstones in the ground, and there were seven brothers supposed to be buried there. And it was to do with the sun setting or rising or something, but it, it, that was the image. And it was years later when we were doing an exhibition in Millmount, where um, it had been rebuilt into a museum now, and had a beautiful white building inside with a spiral staircase. Now, it didn't dawn on me until we uh, John Maloney, the guy that was putting on the exhibition, said, I, I want to go downstairs and set up a, a video loop. So we went downstairs and went, turned on the loop, and on the video came this white lace curtain blowing in the wind. And that's when the hairs on my back stood up, because I said, oh my God, this is the, this is the dream. I'm in the building with the white lace curtain. And it wasn't until that moment that I realised this was the building, and that was Millmount, which was the other major discovery of the connection between Millmount and Tara. Yeah. And it was to do with the sun setting. Yes. And the sun rising. Yeah, solstice. The solstice alignment. Yeah. So you can't tell me there's no spiritual things. This, this is real for me. These are things that I could not have... For, for told at 16 years of age. Yeah. Um, what, what did the headstones represent? The seven brothers. I don't know why there were seven brothers, but then maybe it has to do with Ehrman and Culpa and all the, the, the brothers. Malaysian brothers. Malaysian yeah, brothers. I think there were 12 of them in total, but yeah, there were a lot of them, weren't there? Yeah. But it was the, it was the idea of that connection with the the spiritual realm now uh, t for me that's you, i felt after that point i was being guided as you well know all the strange coincidences that happened while we were doing the research um started to crop up but that's another story yeah but that's that was the beginning even though the dreams had been several decades earlier. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, you kind of... <clears throat> and see then the boat and all the Cuchulain stuff and all the stuff is the fact, the funny that the, the boat was called Satanta, which is yeah. Cuchulain's name before he became... And of course there's a connection there with the stones because Cuchulain was supposed to have killed his only son there. He didn't know he was his son. That's right. He was supposed to... And I think that's very much... Yeah. From the description, that's where the sun came ashore. Yeah, that's right, at Beltray. Yeah, Aoife, Aoife's only son, yeah. Fascinating stuff. You, But you also, Richard, you, you had another dream, I remember you telling me about, involving this, something like the Salmon of Knowledge. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was more recent. That was about t 10, 15 years ago. The dream was, um, I was down at Mornington, again, where the old fish meal... Again, it's on that line. And... There's two fishermen standing to my left, down towards the shoreline. And they're talking to each other. But it's almost as if they were waiting for me. So, the, the other strange thing was, there was no water in the river Boyne. The, the Boyne had been drained completely. And there were only just pools of water at that, along that stretch. So I walked over to the guy and I asked him, have you seen the salmon in knowledge? Where is the salmon in knowledge? And he, he, said, he looked at me, he tall man, black outfit, long white beard. And he said, oh, it's just down there. See that pool of water there? Let's go down there. So I walked down to the pool and I could see the, the fins of the salmon. Because there was so little water in it, he could, there wasn't much to swim away. So I reached down and grabbed him by the tail and lifted him up. He said, that's the salmon. I have the salmon of knowledge now. <laughs> so that was, that was, a, that was the dream. But it was things like that, you know, that um, it's almost like you're being guided 
it was almost like um, you're doing the right thing. Keep going. Yeah. We're, we've got your back. Yeah. Just keep going. You're okay. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure you're okay. Yeah. There's, there's that reassurance in those, in that background. There's nothing to worry about. You'll be okay. Just keep going. Yeah, because, I mean, I've had similar experiences, of course, so I completely identify. Uh, there may be people who are sceptical, but that's perhaps their time will come in terms of, you know, having having similar experiences. Um, but these things are necessarily, I think, laden with meaning for us, you know. It's just that, that that meaning may not be explicit at the time of the dream. No. And as you say, in some cases it can take... 25 or 30 years before the thing actually makes sense which is extraordinary that you remember it in the first place you know they're the kind of dreams you never forget mm. they're just so they're so they just stick in your head you can't you can't forget them yeah they're so strong and um, it's what makes them stand out you normally have in your dream you just forget about it the following morning it's gone you know but these things uh, repeat themselves and they come back and they're, they're almost like they're emphasizing don't forget this is this is important you remember this yeah well your dream actually echoes mythology in a way because first of all the salmon of knowledge was supposed to have grown up as it were in the well of Sagish, which i think is like um mythical imagery for the spawning pools in the upper reaches of the river that's right and then if you think about segish uh, it is on an alignment involving millmount that's and right Tara. that's right i forgot about that mm. straight line yeah go to millmount Tara, the well of segish straight and line one of the myths of the boyne uh, the famous one is Bowen, <clears throat> uh, but the other myth about the Mata, the monster, uh, in the Dinchanicus it says he licked up the boyne until it became a dry river valley. Yeah, 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 I forgot about that. Mm. Th that's strange. It's, it, it's that's a, really strange. I know, but I mean, it's the sort of thing that you and I, when we were re doing our research, it was happening to us all the time. Strange. What we thought was strange, but I, I think you've kind of summed it up nicely that later on you come to see it as an affirmation. Yeah. Like somebody's just patting you on the shoulder and say, or tapping you on the back and pushing you and going, yeah, yeah. that's keep going, track. keep yeah. going with this, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm really, really looking forward to the next conversation because I think that's um, that's the Cygnus thing. Well, Cygnus and 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 yeah, Cygnus and and all of the discoveries and the excitement of it. You know, when do you think you might have your book? when it's finished yeah there you go <laughs> no no there's no rushing uh such works so, it has to be uh, done right uh, yeah there's no rushing perfection no um yeah but i i would say that you know people don't realize perhaps that because things change and there's so much change nowadays in five years no yeah. You know, that in a half century, you know, the ways of life and the pace of life and the appearance of towns and landscapes can completely change. And you have, I think, a record, a lovely record, in mostly in vibrant colour of fairly dramatic change in Drogheda and to its people and its its streetscape. Uh. It's your hometown. You want to, you want to leave some memory of us. Yeah. So the artist is, in essence, a chronicler of the history of yeah. the area. Yeah. In 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 as much a way as any writer or any historian is. In fact, almost in a more valid way. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose that. Painting is a it's another language. Yeah. I'm just trying to communicate through paint. Mm. And I think it's obvious from the conversation we've been having that you have seen that in exquisite detail. Mm. Like the historian is looking at documents. 
right? Yeah. The artist is, as you have so poetically put, you're looking at the the uh, the patterns. You're looking at the the colors, the vibrancy. You're looking at the life. You're looking at the walls and even the stones of the walls and the different colors. That's right. You're seeing it in exceptional detail. In a way, I think that the historian can never really appreciate. Experience is the best way to do these things. Live it. Live in it. Yeah. Given the nature of the change that you've seen, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it in print, you know, do you have any thoughts about the future and... Where do you see things in 10 or 20 years? Or? I have no idea. No, I know, but I mean... No, just... I don't know. I, I don't know. Are you sanguine? Are you optimistic? Or are you <clears throat> fearful? Are you no. indifferent? The boss has everything under control. That's, that's <laughs> the way I see things. <laughs> I, I don't worry about it. Yeah. I don't really worry about it anymore. Not... No, I'm not afraid. Yeah. I'll take it as it comes. Fair enough. You know, it's just... It's, you're better off... Um, I think I find people get more stressed out when they haven't got control over over their lives. And I think um, if, if bad things happen, deal with it. Just, just it's... Try and, try and take the positive out of it. Don't... Um, don't try to fight it. It's it's happening. It's life. It's just that's the way it is. Yeah. And I think if you just work your way around it, you know, just uh, there's obstacles in your way. Just sort of you'll get around it. Just you just have to believe you, you'll get around it, even if it doesn't go your way. You know, just just keep doing the best you can. There's nothing you can do except do the best you can. Yeah. And then at least you've at least you've tried that. Simple but very relevant and perfect yeah. advice. Because if you go around complaining about this, that, and the other, and fighting against this and fighting against that, all you're doing is wasting energy. Just yeah. just get on and do something positive with what you can around you. You can't change anything that's going on in another part of the world. I can change something that's immediately around me. Uh, at least if I can do that, I'm making some positive in- impact. But there's no point in worrying about what's going on in another country. You know, that's yeah. that's their that's their fight. So it's probably fair to say you're not you're not really an anxious person. No. Look, um, I've been. You know, things happen. Just get, try and figure your way out. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a solution to every problem. Yeah. You know. Was it? I think it's Einstein who's. Was it? I see memes on Facebook, and I don't know whether they're true or not. <laughs> you know, uh, was it Einstein who is said to have said, "You know, stay away from negative people. They will find a problem for every solution." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. All right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it should be. A, it's better to do something positive than than complain and, and be negative about it. Just just okay, that's that's it. Get around it. Deal with it. Do the best you can. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. <laughs> just just um Sounds like you have to get back to painting. Yeah, I'm doing a bit, but it's yeah, I'm just I'm beginning to I'm beginning to find a little a little fire going on now, you know. Brilliant. So I'm beginning to, I'm, because I'm looking through all my paintings for the book, I'm beginning to remember the good things. And sometimes I, I've, there are paintings that I put aside and said, oh, that's crap, you know. Now I look at them and say, God, that's, you know, that's not bad at all, you know. <laughs> you know God, I didn't realise I could do that, you know. Are you your own worst self-critic? You see, when you're in the moment, you're trying to achieve something. Mm. And then, well, you don't quite get it. Mm. But you've, you've done the best you can. And you say, ah, I'll put that aside. I'm not going to bother with that. 
and leave it there. And then 20 years later, you're looking at it and saying, God, that wasn't a bad effort, you know. Yeah. And um, now I can see, I can see things that I, maybe I, I have to go back to that now. That was interesting, and I should have kept going. But now I can, I can go back to it and and study that aspect of painting, and it's become exciting again. Yeah, yeah. I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah. I looked through on the screen the draft, and it's an early draft of your book, admittedly. Mm -hmm. And I was scrolling down through all these wonderful paintings and photographs and a wonderful chronicle. I, re I really think it's going to be a very important work. But something that struck me was, wow, there's such an array of work here. It's fabulous. And you said to me, almost as I'd finished scrolling through, you said, oh, most of that is the stuff I never sold. Mm. That's right. In other words, one could imply from that that it's not your best work. And in fact, your best work is hanging in people's houses around the yes. town. Yeah. A and yet, I never got that impression scrolling through it. I mean, I was just mesmerised, you know. Mm. Well, I've been surprised myself because pe these paintings that I kind of rejected now, sort of, oh, yeah, I got, I got something out of that. Yeah, I shouldn't have been so harsh on it. Mm. But um, I was just trying to strive for a perfection of some sort, or yeah. trying to achieve a something I didn't quite get. Yes. But it's now, with years of experience later, I can see the direction I was going and I, I need to go back and, and and continue that line and just see where that brings me now. So you'd, I didn't appreciate them at the time, but now I do. Because I, from years of looking at other stuff, I can see it with a, a, a more distant eye. Yeah. So when you read, I mean, I'm I, I'm not very well read on artists, I have to admit, but when you hear about the great artists, right, there's almost like a mythical um, aura about them. They they have attained for us now the likes of Van Gogh and Monet and, you know, oh yeah, Cezanne brilliant. and all those people whose paintings now command a hundred million or whatever it happens mm. to be at auction. But yet when you read about the lives that they had and the difficulties they encounter, something that strikes you is they were extraordinarily human and ordinary people at the end of yeah, the day. Just like you or me or anyone else, there's no difference. They mm. just just had a vision to to try something. They mightn't have achieved any. They mightn't have achieved any fame in their own lifetime, but it didn't matter because it was later on that people got, like like I say, when you look back in your work and you say, well, oh God, there was something going on there, you know, so that's interesting. Yeah, they didn't attain it in life, but now they've achieved a sense of some sort of form of immortality almost, haven't they? Mm. But then, <clears throat> I, I hope you don't mind me bringing this in, um, Richard, but I know there's been times when you've been sort of not hitting the... Yes, the spot where inspiration is concerned. I think you told me once or twice that you'd actually torn up paintings that you'd done. Was that out of frustration or did you really feel that they... Well, I don't really like to tear up painting, but mm. sometimes you just say, ah, well, that was a waste of time. Yeah. You know, but it, I think I, what I, I did one time, um, I was teaching a group of um, active retirement people, you know, they, doing classes with them so uh, they asked me would I bring in some work so I, I brought in bad work that I did because I wanted them to see you know not everything I did is the finished product that you see normally in in, in a gallery yeah. you know the, you don't see the hard work all you see is this perfection and they're all you know they'd be kind of amazed like, but here's here's the stuff that doesn't work guys so if what I was trying to teach them was, you have to do the bad stuff to get the good stuff. You know, you've you got to make mistakes to learn. So be, the more mistakes you make, the better. Because then you're learning every time you make a mistake. You say, well, it's not, that's not the way I want to go. i try this way, and then that doesn't work. You try another way. And you keep going till you, till you hit the, till you find it. And that's, that's, so making mistakes is a good thing. Yeah. No, no harm in making bad paintings. That's how you learn. It's exactly the same with writing. Yeah, you've got to make And there's so many people who say they want to be writers and they don't write. 
And the fear, I think the fear is that they'll write something and they'll read it back and they'll think that's rubbish. Yeah. And like you're saying, that's valuable. Yeah. Because the rubbish will spur them on to do something better. Exactly. But if they don't do it in the first place, they'll never don't, learn. Yeah, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mm. It's okay. That sounds like a cliched yeah. life lesson, but it's so bloody true, isn't it? It's true, yeah. It's always true. The child has to fall a couple of times when he's learning how to walk. Yeah. You know, you've got to fall. Absolutely. You've got to feel the pain. Yeah. 100%. Here's going to be a total curveball question. Yeah. Uh, is it expensive to be an artist in terms of the materials? I never think of it like that. Like? Not really, no. You can draw on anything. Is can... there top end stuff that you'd be better using in, in other, for to, to, to extend the lifetime of your painting? Like, how much is a tube of paint, for instance? I don't know these things. Probably a tenner, maybe. Yeah. Tubes should be... A, they last you a good while. They get you a good few paintings, you know. Yes. Or you could just stick to a pencil. It's a cheap p- piece of paper. Yeah. As long as you're drawing, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can get precious about stuff, and then you won't da- do the damn thing. Concentrate see. on the art, first and foremost, and not yeah, necessarily on the materials. Yeah, first questions, lasers. Yeah. See the same thing in photography where there's a lot of photographers now obsessed about having the latest cameras and obsessed with megapixels and dynamic range and this, that and the other. And it, it, seems, okay to me that so, it seems to me that some of them spend more of their time talking about equipment than actually taking photographs, you know. Yeah, well, it's just get out there. So it's not sure. really relevant. And here's another one for you that's just come into my mind. When you when you have the the, the, the easel the slung on, over your back <laughs> and in the box, how many tubes of paint? How many different? What's your color range for the average? Would you have five tubes okay, of different? Ten, white, twenty. You have white, red, yellow, and blue, but you could have a couple of different yellows and a couple of different blues and a couple of different. Um, what's the red, yellow, and blue? Yeah. Um, and can you the, make pretty much any color from those? Most of them, yeah. Yeah. Like I say, but when you come to painting flowers, that's when you have to go and, oh. <laughs> and buy that tube of paint. I remember one time I, I couldn't get a, a particular violet colour. And I was asking one of the other artists, you know, you know what blooming colour? I want to get this particular violet. She so just buy that tube of, you know, violet. And I said, right, pure colour, straight from the tube, bang, dead on. Perfect. Yeah. Do you ever... mix, I couldn't mix all the other colours well, well, to get that colour. Yeah, you see, I was, that was the next question. There are obviously times when you struggle to make a colour. Yeah. Does that sometimes stymie your work? It can, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I remember the three of us were here one day, three of us. I, there was this flower, it was a polyanthus flower. It had this particular colour. And we had, at the time, we were sort of saying, well, we're going to use French ultramarine, cadmium red, and you know, cadmium yellow and white. And we wouldn't use black. So you get the dark colours just using the red and the blues, which worked fine until I p- bought this polyanthus home. I said, I'll do a still life with this one. And I said, I can't get the colour of this particular colour. Uh, so the three of us are, are there mixing colours, left, right and centre, trying to get this colour and none of them would work. I said, what the hell with this? So and then I got a this particular colour in the in the shop, and I come back, mix a bit of white, bingo, there you are. So it just, that was a, an introduction of the next colour from on our palette, which um, we had no choice. You had to buy the colour. There's just some colours you can't mix with other colours. Yeah, it's they're so pure, you know. Yeah. Do you find it difficult to paint people, uh, people's faces, for instance? I mean, I know it's, you've done portraits, and your portraiture is fabulous. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing portraits, um, I treat it like anything else, any landscape. All I'm doing is trying to get the right colour in the right place. And yeah. when you get that, well, the portrait comes through. Yeah. So you just you treat it like everything else. Mm. It's What colour is it? Where is it? Yes. Set it down. Simple. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Except and, for I can't paint for shit. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. No, we did a lovely little painting there years ago uh, of a tube of paint and I thought it was lovely. So 
Don't well, mind him, he does know what he's doing. Yeah, <laughs> but, but in, in, in response to that, I would say that Richard, uh, as a teacher, and I know that you've done art classes for years and years, for adults and for children, mm. I find that you are eminently encouraging. You're so positive. You're so encouraging. And that, by the way, extends into encouraging the likes of me in my writing and my photography. But uh, you're almost the ideal teacher from that point of view, because as in your mind, I, I guess there's no such thing as a bad artist. No, no. Just it, it depends on the, on the, on the character and what they want. If they're looking for, if they're looking for fame and thing and fortune, <laughs> they come to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I think if you have to have a pure heart, I think, I mean you have to have a passion for what you, you have to find what your passion is, yeah. in your life, and it has to mean something to you, not to somebody else. You got to be yourself. You sound like Joseph Campbell there, which is brilliant. Oh, uh, have you had any students, uh, pupils, yeah. let's say younger kids under ten, for instance, yeah, where they've come in and you've seen them and you kind of make a call on them fairly quickly and you think they're special. Oh, they are, and, yeah. and, and they have turned out to be exemplary artists or, or really brilliant artists. There's been a few that have passed through, yes. Mm. Um, that must be very rewarding for you. Not necessarily, you're just, not necessarily taking the credit no, for no, it, no. I know. But. No, no, no. Yes. I just want to see them happy in doing... doing. I want, to, I want them to have the happiness I had in painting yeah and if it's if it's for them i i try and find out what where where their passion is and then sort of say well have a look at this person or have a look at this artist you know and see if see if it, that's where they want to go and then it's up to themselves then to to follow that but it, it's always to encourage their own belief um to be themselves and to find their own path because that's that's where they they belong they don't have to be like anyone else. But say, for instance, um, you were talking about Van Gogh there. Suppose Van Gogh wanted to be like somebody else. We'd never see those beautiful sunflowers or the, yeah. or the, the, the wonderful starry nights because that's, that's what, that was his passion, you know? Yeah. And he followed that. And that's why we're so lucky to have them now. Yeah. So if everybody... It doesn't matter. It's, it, just do what you have to do. Yeah. And even if... It, I mean... Uh, it's not all about fame or no, no. Fame. It's art. Just, art is psychotherapeutic. Yeah, isn't it? No, oh, yeah, because you it put it puts you in the now, and you can totally engross in something that it's it's like a form of meditation. Yeah, you know, you can really meditate deeply. I remember up painting in, in the this pond nearby, and I was up there for about three hours. Painting. No one else around me. Nobody there for the, for the whole of that time. But by the end of the three hours, I felt um, I got I got really high. If you if not, I felt so connected with everything, because at one stage I was painting this part of the, the landscape, and I was thinking that tree over there. No, that tree is not over there. I I mean we're not separated. We're there's no, there's no, there's no separation. I'm part of all of this, so it became one with the whole landscape. It sounds, it's it sounds like you're a, ca a Catholic ver ver verging on Buddhism. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, but it, it, it was like that. That mm. that was the sensation. It was the the total connectedness because I had been there for so long. Yeah, absorbing, taking in the color and the and the and the landscape, that it just merged into it. Mm -hmm. Psychologically, sure. yeah, and it, it was kind of a realization. But we are none of us are separate. Nothing is separate. We're all connected. You know, Rainy Descartes, the philosopher. Yeah, everything is connected to everything else. The Cartesian points. Well, that's what I felt. Everything was connected. That must have been an extraordinary feeling. Oh, it was. It was wonderful. You didn't want to go home. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, no, I just wanted to stay up there. And so there, the moments. Yeah. The exhilarating yeah. moments where you... Yeah, th that's what painting can do sometimes. You're in the landscape and you're suddenly so immersed into it because you're communicating with it. You're, you're listening to what it's telling you. Um, you're pulling out the colour. You're, you're, 
It's almost as, as, as if it's talking to you. you. You listen visually, and, and you know you listen to the birds and you listen to the the leaves rustling and the trees. You, you know everything is 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 so part of you. Absolutely brilliant, you know. Oh no, it's, uh, I, I, if anyone can just sit still for a little while have no one else around you and just just sit in nature just absorb it yeah not do it yeah but they 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 are the simple pleasures that so many people deny themselves because as you say they're stuck in traffic eternally yeah they're sitting in offices they're they're at home doing chores or taking part in repetitive cycles of activity that at their at their base are are nonsensical yeah depriving themselves of these precious moments you know yeah, it's good to get out. It's amazing watching you, Richard, in the past half hour, how much more animated you've become as we've sort of... There's a real light in your eyes when you're yeah. talking about this. You can really see the effect that it's... it's no, it's just a heaven. You. Mm. It's just like stepping into heaven for a while. Have a heaven here and now, huh? Yeah, you know you're not, you know you're not on your own. You're not alone. Mm. You're never alone. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. Uh, something if you don't mind me picking up on it you yeah. talked about the birds and yeah. you, you listen by looking but you also listen with your ears yeah. now you have a hearing problem right yeah. and I, I, the reason I bring it up um, is how much do you think that the fact that you've slightly dulled hearing improves the visual? visual they say one sense makes up for another yes it does do you yeah. think that's a th- uh, that's a, it was a blessing in disguise yeah I remember um, when I was very young, uh, one of the nuns was asked me um, when I was in the class, she, do you feel you've missed out by not having the hearing? And I said, well, not really. I said, because I would have been an awful arse <laughs> <laughs> if I had perfect hearing because it would have made me a different character. But that humbled me and um, it made me realise, you know, it's it kind of, it kind of, you can understand suffering in other people then. Yeah. You know, because you know, if you don't suffer, you don't understand it in other people. Yeah. You can empathise then. Yes. Uh, I think that's, um, to me, that was a gift rather than a... A hindrance. Yeah. That's a very, very interesting viewpoint, yeah. And it goes back to the point I made earlier on about I would think that you're... My opinion of you is that you're a rather compassionate human being. Yeah. Yeah. That you have um, that. There was one there was one scene uh, uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion. It's it's the The Passion it's, of the Christ, yeah. yeah. There was one scene and it really stuck out. It's, he's on the cross, he's dying, and he's getting mocked, he's in extreme pain, he's suffering incredible suffering, right? And he turns around and he says, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's the core. I, I totally believe that. Because you can't, if those people really knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do that. Of course. And yeah. that's, that's, the, um, that's the crux of, of... They don't know how much they're doing it to themselves. No. no. The torturing of others is really a, 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 an extension of the torture that you're just committing to yourself, you know. Mm. You can let that cat out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> this is part and parcel of live recording, you know. Oh, she's she's, she's oh. making herself very vocal. She wants to go out. <laughs> but uh, as an artist, of course, um, you, I think, have a greater appreciation of other works of art oh yeah in film for instance yeah, I, love you've a, I know that you've a great admiration for other artists and sculptors but film is another media in which the artist can really come to the fore yeah gibson's uh, movie was controversial some of the critics didn't like it at all and, and then didn't understand it. some of the well some of the religious people i think thought that um it it went too far in absolving Pilate of his role in the thing, you know, that he, he was listening oh, to the, the, great, the Jewish priests and the elders and all the rest. <clears throat> there's a great, that 
that when Pilate's talking to his wife after he's had a conversation with him, he said, what is truth? And said, you know what truth is. And she, she says, yes, I do. Don't you? you know? And he said, well, what is it? And she says, if you don't, what was it? If you cannot hear it, no one can tell you. Yeah. And I thought, a stunning piece. Yeah. That, yeah. Absolutely stunning. Said, if you cannot hear it, no one can tell you. Yeah. Uh, it just uh, that's another that those two points in that film they were the the key points for me. The rest of it's uh, just, but that was that, that's what I took uh, away from us. Forgiveness and um, listen for the truth. Truth is subjective, relative, yeah. in cases. But, but you know what I mean. You know the, the essence of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, at a particular you, you can't level. go for you can't make you can't move forward without the, without a tr without the truth even if you don't like it yeah the truth's always solid it's always it's a good foundation um as you say but you have to know what it is yeah so but sometimes it's just not what you want it to be yeah we live in the internet age of mm. course and social media it would strike me that there are a lot of very exceptionally talented, creative people out there. There's thousands. Yeah. yeah. That is something that you're really magnanimous about. You're, you're always very praiseworthy of other artists' work, when, when it deserves it, of course, yeah. in your opinion. Yeah. opinion. <clears throat> you don't strike me as the sort of person who ever gets jealous of when another artist is doing really well. No, because it's, they you're, deserve it. You're delighted for them. Mm. They've worked hard for us. Yeah. It's it's if somebody's doing well, encourage them. It's, it's it's hard enough. Yeah. It's hard enough to be creative and do the thing you want to do without somebody pulling you down. Mm. You gotta yeah. you know, I, I I know where they're coming from, so Yes. Just give it a go anyway. Like you, they have their own lives to live their own human existences and yeah. family and personal relationships and financial worries and all the rest yeah. they all behind have... that apparent success is another human being with you know yeah emotions and with topsy-turvy lives in some yeah. cases yeah. yeah it's always good to recognize that Can I conclude by asking you what well, sounds like a morbid question, but I know you won't mind. Well, and I know you are self-effacing and you're not an egotistical person, but what do you think the most apt inscription on your headstone would be? <laughs> oh, God, I haven't even thought of that. <clears throat> well, I, I, most just... people don't. I've no, <laughs> I've no, I haven't even gone that to that stage. I don't think I even want a headstone. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's 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 bypassing the question, Richard. You know? I know, yeah. Um, I don't. I it's bury the ego, I suppose. Yeah. Interesting. Get yeah. rid of your ego. Mm. And you'll do all right. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. That's a good answer. I was going, I wanted to put a plaque up outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the shape of a headstone, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, I'd love to, I'd love to do it. Um, I couldn't think of the Latin, because the ego is ego in Latin anyway. So, But it was, the idea was, park your car and your ego outside. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it strikes me that uh, Neil Gaiman, I've seen him, he gave a lecture, it was on YouTube, and he kept coming back to the same mantra every time, no matter what happens, no matter who you're talking to, no matter who puts you down, no matter how much money you have or haven't got, just make good art. Yeah. And that really struck home with me. It's just, that yeah. is the fundamental thing you must do as a, as a creative person is to be, is to create. Yeah. You know? Do you ever think about that in religious terms, that you're a creator? Oh, well, I'm just trying to follow the boss. He was, a, he was some artist. <laughs> well, it, when you it, think of us. 
well or, or if, you, if you try and get a little bit of what he's at or she we live in such a wonderful world oh god yeah the, mean, struct the structure and patterns and colours and it's mesmerising isn't it totally yeah I think when you start looking at life as it is not put anything on it but just look at it and how how astonishing it is that it, it that we even exist is another thing it's just it shouldn't happen but it did the way I say it, Richard, is that uh, I, I consider almost everything to be a miracle. Yeah, life is a miracle, yeah. Mm. You know, when you start looking at astronomy and physics and, and yeah. biology, it's just, it's just uh, I don't know. I, the more science gets involved, the more they look at and the more they discover, it's just, it's just, it's beyond wonderful. It's an odd thing, isn't it, that science would in by and large science would want to do away with religious fervor and and faith and and yet at the same time as you rightly say there as science makes more astonishing discoveries science becomes awesome in a way that makes it a religious experience yeah. oh I'm, i love science i i think it's absolutely brilliant that and and the amount of stuff they've discovered in the last 10 years it's just it's off the wall it's just, it's just they're doing great work out there yeah um oh yeah i remember um joseph mendel the fellow who um he was a monk uh he joined the monks because he didn't want to be bothered with you know having to work for a living <laughs> <laughs> you know having to get food and all he wanted to do is research and in, in the, the you know this um pollinating or Cross pollinating the peas. He was the one that discovered the the genetics. Do you remember him? Um, so he was studying the cross pollinating the peas and you know peas. Peas, yeah, that P -E -A -S. was P E A S. Yeah, um, he was trying to <laughs> he was trying to figure out how to how it worked, and he was he wasn't getting the results. And the interesting thing about him was. He didn't criticise um, th the way it was being done. He criticised his own way of doing it. He said, what am I doing wrong that's not working? And I, f I felt, ah, that's the, there's a fellow I like, you know, that's, that's, he's, he's, on the, he's on the right track. Because he's, you know when somebody has an idea and they think this is the way it should end and it doesn't work out and they get mad? Mm -hmm. He didn't. He just said, right. That didn't work. Let's try this. And he kept doing it till he discovered the the, the clues. Yeah. And another one was uh, Da Vinci. He said, um, "Experience has been the mistress of all who have taught well, and as mistress, I'll take her." He was talking about experience being being the uh, where you learn, and that was that was the important key. Yeah. That, that reminds me of another internet meme. It's one of the movie stars, not Robert Mitchum, someone like that, yeah. who apparently said, um, "Judgment, something about judgment coming from experience, and experience coming from bad judgment." Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's something like that. Life is a great teacher, isn't it? Yeah. Can be a, a harsh uh, master at times, but oh yeah. All for the good, I think, mostly. Yeah, your expectations don't always go mm. the way you want it. Yeah. But then that's where you learn. But, our Richard, your work surely is in the creation of the moment rather than in the end product or the sale. No, it's the process. Yeah. Not the end That's result. where your bliss is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I enjoy the making of the thing. Let someone else enjoy the looking at them then after that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, um, can I say what an extraordinary delight and a privilege it has been to chat to you. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, that's because another... that will take us down a few very interesting <laughs> rabbit holes. Yes, of course. Yeah, we... We'll move into the, the mythological. 
and uh, wish you all the best with the book. Thank you very much. I really think it's a very important publication and very much looking forward to seeing it in print. Well, we'll have to wait and see then. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the way it always is? We'll have yeah. to wait and see. Thanks a million. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Anthony Murphy and we have been chatting with Richard Moore. <laughs>